I'd like to call this meeting to order. The meeting is now in session. Please rise for the presentation of the colors by the Career Center, Air Force, JROTC. Please be seated. So we're going to begin tonight. Um, I did not know it was my birthday. We're we have a, a presentation on robotics. This is like a very special day for me. <laughs> I'm really excited. Um, our recognition is a student so showcase on robotics. Mr. Chris Martini, Director of Career, Technical, and Adult Education, will introduce the presenters. Good evening. Uh, we're honored to be here tonight to showcase some of the robotic activities that are going on around the county. Uh, this has been a true uh, collaborative effort um, with many people involved from my office and also around the county. Uh, Pam Nagurka, our STEM specialist, Missy uh, Parks have been very helpful. Um, our teachers that we have here tonight, um, Rob Dudak, uh, Stephanie Lynn, and also uh, Wendy Maitland. And I also see um, Brian Boykin also in the audience and has been a very supporter of our program as well. Um, our students are experiencing integrative, uh, the integration of subject-specific knowledge to solve real-world challenges using robotics. Uh, let's see here. Um, the after-school program provides opportunities for our students to explore computers and microprocessors and how they interact with manufacturing, transportation, and communication systems. Students are involved in problem-solving activities that require them to program and integrate computer systems with a mobile device either autonomously or with a driver interface. Uh, these activities are done within the classroom, at workshops, and also at competitions uh, throughout the county and the state. Um, you will see different students using different platforms as they are performing uh, their, uh, as you see their robots working tonight. Um, let's see. Let's see, we're missing a slide. In our first year, we're, um, we're tracking our robotics and the number of students that are involved, and we do have quite a few. Um, we have uh, elementary students. We have about 39 that are participating right now. In the middle school, we have 137. Uh, and at the high school, we have 104 students that are participating. So what I'd like to do tonight is kind of throw, uh, we're going to start out with the middle school, then you'll see elementary, and then you'll see a high school program. So uh, Mr. Robert Dudek is going to explain um, the Lego League and what uh, Williamsburg is doing with the Lego League competition that we have, the first Lego League. Rob? It's 
So thanks to the board, Dr. Murphy, Mr. Martini, um, for giving us this opportunity to share our version of problem-based learning. That's a buzzword lately, and that's what we do. Um, I'm Robert Dudek. My last name is D-U-D-E-K, so if you drop off the K, that becomes Dude. So I am known to my students as Mr. Dude or, for the robotics team, Coach Dude. Because I, I bring to this robotics uh, uh, extracurricular after-school program more of a, like an elite sport activity um, where we have a lot of people that come to us with many skills that they've learned either in elementary school or on their own. Um, and then I give them more skills and more teamwork skills. And then um, we will go, come together and do competitions um, as an as a organized team. So we're working for a team, uh, as a team for a common goal. And again, we're problem-based learning. Um, I'm happy to introduce several of my students from Williamsburg who will speak and share about some of the activities that they've learned either in the robotics club or the robotics class. And so first, Sumner, why don't all three of you guys come up and stand back here? Hello, school board members. Thank you for having us here tonight to talk to you about our amazing experiences with the robotics program in Arlington Public Schools. My name is Jason Klein, and this is my third year on the Williamsburg Middle School Ro Wolfbots robotics team. My favorite aspects of participating on the robotics team are building and programming robots and making new friends with whom I share a common interest. I particularly enjoy computer programming and the engineering design process and with WolfBots, I get to do it all with friends. Every year we work together toward a common goal, participating in the first LEGO League robotics competition. It is an all-day competition during which we face multiple tests. Not only is there a major robotics component in which we build and program a lot to complete a bot to complete as many themed missions as possible, but we also complete and present a research project and are tested on our first LEGO League core values. I'm going to talk to you about the research project and core values, and then my friend Sumner is going to talk to you about the robot. Next, you'll hear from WolfBots alum, Reem, who has robotics experience from elementary school as well as middle school, and is participating in the new year-long robotics class with Coach Dude. Last year, the first LEGO League competition theme was Animal Allies. So we did a research and community service project on helping pet owners, on helping prevent pet owners from overfeeding their dogs. We learned a lot about this issue during our research and then shared with the community through a PSA. It was really exciting that we won first prize for our project last year. The board on that side is what we presented. We also focus on the first LEGO League core values. My favorite is cooperation. The idea that you can cooperate with other kids while competing at the same time. For example, my friend Davey demonstrated great cooperation last weekend by helping the seventh grade WolfBots team, against whom we technically compete, get some points on the board when they are struggling. Now I will turn things over to Sumner, who will show you our robot and explain what it can do. Hi, I'm Sumner. My robotic experience actually spans two states. I was on a robotics team at my old school in Minnesota before joining the WolfBots in seventh grade. It was nice to have that continuity and be able to keep doing what I really enjoy. I have with me today the robot we are building for the competition this year. Um, so this robot was developed over time, weeks actually. We started with an idea about how the robot and the attachments would work together. Research our idea, designed the bot, built it and tested it, and tested it. We prototyped some of the parts as we went along. 
So the robot has two light sensors in the bottom, two motors here that we can use for attachments, and a gyro sensor in the middle, as well as two motors. And if it was on, I would have it move for you, but it's refusing to start. <laughs> so now I would like to introduce you to Reem, who also has a broad experience with robotics. Hi, I'm Reem. For starters, I was on the Arlington Science Focus Robotics team while I was in elementary school. It was really fun and incredibly exciting because we advanced to the first LEGO League State competition. Then I enjoyed the Wolfbots for sixth grade, where I particularly enjoyed working on our research project. That year, the theme was trash, so we, had to, we, so we did a project on how to dispose of refrigerators when you are done with them, which is actually pretty tricky. Now I'm in a year-long eighth grade robotics program, which I thoroughly enjoy. We program in VEX, which is different than First Lego League. I think I've really maximized the benefits of the APS robotics program. I built 21st century skills, practiced my public speaking, learned a lot about working in, working in groups, and I'm learning pretty advanced computer programming and engineering design skills. For example, here's a test bed that I've been working on. The program... Oh. The program that I'm supposed to do is I press the switch and the wheels will rotate clockwise and after that I'll press the bumper switch which then the wheels will stop rotating. Yeah, and that's just like a basic movement that we've been learning in our robotics class. Thank you for your interest in and support of the APS robotics program. We really enjoy it and, and appreciate the opportunity. Uh, now, Steph now Stephanie Lynn's going to come up and uh, show the elementary school team. teach science at Arlington Science Focus School. I'm here to introduce um, our two captains of our first LEGO League team. So we also compete um, in the same tournament that Williamsburg does. Uh, we just compete in a different division. Um, and so this is uh, Mark Merrill and Josiah Webster. Um, and I couldn't have picked two better captains for our team. But it was team member selected. Um, sometimes as a coach, you um, try to sway, want to this, things to sway in a certain direction. <laughs> But the kids, they, they saw the leadership qualities that these two demonstrated and, and voted just as I would have. So Mark and Josiah. Okay, so greetings from ASFS. My name is Josiah Webster and I'm in fourth grade going to the, oh wait, sorry, that was. <laughs> Me and Mark try to encourage the team when they are frustrated. One of the reasons LEGO Robotics is important is because the world isn't perfect, but our ideas can catch on. We have learned lots of skills, like working as a team. At the moment, the team is divided into deciding which robot uh, to choose, because we have two of them. Uh, we all hope that it will blow over soon, and it will. Hello, I guess. Hi, my name is Mark Merrill and I'm at fifth grade. I'm in fifth grade at Arlington Science Focus School. Some things I learned in LEGO Robotics is one, how to code a LEGO Mindstorm EV3. I also learned how to fix problems that come in our way, especially during the robot and the project. We have fun with our team and we work together de designing the robot. I'm a good team member because I help take control of conversations, especially during team challenges. I let others help and we love working with everyone. Our robot design. Our robot is very compact. It has large wheels to give it speed, therefore it's very fast. Our robot is perfectly symmetrical and attachments are easily put on and taken off. I've been working on the filter mission where the robot pushes the block and then the latch drops. So we have a program to run for you. This is actually the program that we'll use for this mission, but we can't show it because we need the map for it. Okay. 
this program you'll see they can take a straight line and then a 90 degree angle turn and then another 90 degree angle turn. The next program is to show you how fast it goes. Thank you. <laughs> and our final group, uh, Wendy Maitland, if you can come up and kind of introduce your team. And it's the high school, uh, st the STEM uh, pro uh, club that's over at Wakefield. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for inviting us this evening to come and show our enthusiasm for robotics. Um, as Chris mentioned, my name is Wendy Maitland. I'm the resource teacher for the gifted at Wakefield High School, and I'm sponsor of the STEM club, and the subset is robotics. We meet on Saturdays. Last year, we competed in two competitions, and then this year, um, our interest grew at our school, so we have enough for three teams, and we do still plan to compete in at least two competitions this year. So I'm going to turn it over to our two team captains to um, provide you with some more information about the program. Hi, uh, I'm Suleha Hoffman. I'm a senior at Wakefield High School, and I'm one of the captains of our three robotics teams. Uh, I do the engineering notebook, so I sit and watch everybody do their thing, and I document everything, um, and so everything goes into the notebook. And that's really how we keep track, track of how we design our robot and the different uh, things that succeeded and failed so we can learn from our mistakes. Um, I've been captain for two years, uh, and I really enjoy it. Hi, my name is Dan Otz Perez. I've been part of Wake for Robotics for the past three years, and actually was a founding member. I'm a team captain and a builder, and I really enjoy going through the, the process of just designing and creating a robot. As a team captain, I help coordinate the meetings, and I've had a great experience and been blessed with the opportunity to compete in a VEX Robotics competition. All right, um, so I'm Kevin from Wakefield. Uh, we're all programmers right now. So. Yes, we're, um, my name is Mansoor. Uh, can you hear me well? Yeah. yeah, I'm also a senior at Wakefield High School, and um, I've been in the team for two years. Uh, all four of us here are programmers, and um, we kind of just intermingle between teams, help each other out. You guys want to go ahead and introduce yeah. yourselves as well? Hello, I'm Kirk. Um, for the record, we're, we've all, like, we're all seniors, and we've all been on the team for two years. So, yeah, I'm Kirk. And I'm a programmer. I, I have a lot of fun. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Alejandro. Uh, I'm a senior at Wakefield High School, and I'm a, I'm a programmer as well. And, yeah. So, are, are we going to try out the code? Good. So, okay. what we've got to show you here is we've got, um, this is a practice robot currently. Mm -hmm. This is our pr prototype. It's just kind of like a prototype. Yes. Uh, roughly based off the robot we used last year. So it's essentially just a base and some sensors. It's not a whole bunch to look at. No, <laughs> yeah, it's still some tidying to do. So yeah, so um, we have a control code where like you can control it with the code, and then there's an autonomous mode where the robot uses its sensors to avoid obstacles and turn around. Yeah, so right here we just we control it here. The way we control it is we have the right side. So the way we have it set up to control it is the right side joystick controls the right side wheels and the left side to the left side. So we can do real quick turns just on the fly and make the momentum in space to move, or we can do our regular kind of pivot turns. So one program I have to show you right here is we can use these sonar sensors and these shaft inhibitors to detect where we're going to hit a wall or something. So we're going to run right into it. But since we have these sonar sensors, we're going to stop. And then we have these shaft encoders to kind of have like a precise way to turn roughly exactly 90 degrees. And we can make that at a point of time. If not, it will continue doing this to continue like rotating the circle. So it's like a challenge and it's incredibly fun to see how it stops. 
Right. We've um, delved into the autonomous function a lot more this year. We've learned from our mistakes. And uh, now we've started using sensors and shaft encoders, which we didn't use before. And that provides a lot more accuracy to the movement instead of just predicting distance, measuring for time and speed and other variables. Now we can just do it on the fly. It's a lot more convenient. Um, it's been a great learning experience, just doing things with sensors and the new encoders and everything. Um, we've been stressing autonomous this year a lot more because um, for this competition, the cone stacking, it's going to be much more complex. So I guess we've needed to evolve to that stage. And uh, I'm glad we're making progress. Thank you very much. As you can see, it's kind of progressed from elementary school, where they are programming and more block code, to all the way up to the middle school, where they're starting to see what the different sensors and things are working on and how, how they can use VEX, all the way up to the high school, where they're actually doing um, uh, the robot C code. So we're, we're kind of, uh, we're, we're just in the infancy, we're, we're keeping moving, and I think you can see that uh, the kids are having a great time, and they're learning quite a bit, and they're integrating math, science, and language arts uh, as we're going through programming. So if, any questions? Thank you, Mr. Martini. I was about to say I know that board members are going to have uh, some comments and questions. I do want to quickly say some thank yous, though, um, to clean up. I think you acknowledged a lot of folks. Uh, we have the STEM supervisor, Pam Nagurka, here. Was, um, and did you, were there some other staff that we didn't get a chance to introduce? No, or you I got think that's, uh, that's all of our staff that we have here tonight. Fantastic work, everyone. And I also just want to acknowledge the parents and uh, family members and friends who came along. Can you all just raise your hand real quickly? Because you've been very supportive of this program. <laughs> we have a couple questions for you. Okay. Ms. Ms. Talento? So I have a question on the competition piece. So I, I actually watched that show where robots go and they try to you know demolish each other and I'm always <laughs> sad when one of the robots falls apart so I'm like oh my god all the work so we don't do that right or do you guys have to do that like I would be like oh my gosh or do you guys have like <laughs> obstacle courses that your robots do I mean I'm just curious what does the competition consist of when what are you planning for when you are actually building your robot to compete right so um, last year do you want to come on up to the mic okay um, so, um, in answering your question, uh, last year um, we had the Starstruck competition, so basically with that it involved, it wasn't demolishing robots or anything like that. Um, basically you had stars on the field and you designed robots to basically shove stars over or throw them over kind of a post in the middle of the field to score points, and teams basically fought um, by twos and essentially you try to get more points than the other team by scoring as many stars as you can on their own side and so I guess there's more structure to it than a regular robot demolition match there's more um, I suppose engineering and thinking that goes into to making calculations for just I guess maneuvering around objects picking them up measuring how far to throw and um, it's just more intuitive. Yes. Oh, also, actually, I'd like to add on this year. Um, I think there's a, yeah, there's a different competition every year. So um, Star Strike was last year. This year, we've moved on to, um, I forget the actual name, but uh, in, the in the zone. So essentially, you're stacking cones instead on um, different goals on the field. And that's the way to score points. So. Um, it would definitely be, you definitely have different designs every single year because a robot that could throw stars over to the other side might not be as useful this year. So, of course, you'd have to change and kind of adjust for that. Thank you so much for sharing. That was fascinating. They meet on Saturdays. You can uh, join a team go. if you'd like. I may go. Do we have any work sessions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we should. That would be great. Uh, I, I just want to ask Mr. Martini, um, just so we can get a sense of the breadth of this mm -hmm. program in Arlington Public Schools right now. I think mm -hmm. we've been watching this grow and expand over time, especially over the last few years. Right. Um, the Williamsburg team, for example, several of the students mentioned they did this in elementary school. Right. And I think it's becoming kind of an elite program where you want to kind of be out of track. So could you tell us a little bit both 
um, if, if we have programs at every school at the different levels. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, um, do you have to get on a track in elementary school in order to, to get to this level these, these kids are at? Or how, how inclusive is this program for kids who want to join it at different ages? Right. Right now we have um, programs at each of the middle schools and the high schools. We have teams there. Um, or clubs there. Um, they are competing on different ones. We have some through the TSA Technology Student Association where they're doing some VEX and then we also have the FIRST Robotics. There are some FIRST Robotics team. Uh, we have about four stipends this year for the elementary school and we are looking at expanding that. Um, and they are doing, um, one of the criteria were that they would be working after school and they would also be going to some competitions and some of the schools are doing some things throughout the day. Um, and so um, we don't have all of those numbers, but uh, as far as the clubs, we have four that are at the ele elementary school this year um, that are going with the stipend, and then we are looking at growing that. Um, and it, they do not have to start just in um, elementary school to feed all the way up. Uh, some of the, I mean, how many, are there anybody here that, that just started in high school? Yeah. But, yeah. So it's not a, yeah, it, it's not a criteria. Um, I think um, with the Legos, it really kind of gets excite, you know, excitement for some of the kids when they elementary school. But you know, you can come in at any time and be very uh, a very good team member and uh, participate and um, you know get a good experience from it as well. And I have uh, just one more question too. I hate to bring up the pesky topic of money, but this is not an inexpensive program. There's there are materials, and again, just mm -hmm. so that we understand, is this something that's basically an extracurricular funded with a lot of parent support, or are we supporting this internally? Uh, we've been supporting some of it in internally, and I would say that uh, we just received a grant for um, the Wakefield team. Uh, that was through the state. It was the STEM competition team grant. So it actually gave us some funding so that we can go ahead and get them out to some of the competitions um, and to help support them with some equipment, some more robots. Uh, that's one of the things that we've been trying to do. Um, some of our Perkins funds have been uh, used for that as well um, so that we can get robotics more and more into the hands of our students. So um, we're kind of using um, a number of um, sources for the funding of that. Understood. All right. Um, shall we take a photo? Sure. Uh, students, teachers, uh, supervisors, etc. Yeah, robots too. Robots too. I got a
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, we're now at announcements. I think you can probably all hear me if I just proceed ahead. Uh, on November 7th, we will have a budget work session at 7.30 p.m. in room 101. On November 8th, the board will hold a closed meeting at 5.30 p.m. in the board conference room. Uh, board members, do you have any announcements? Yes, Ms. Van Dorn. I do have an announcement, and I think I have a picture. Ah, there we go. Okay, so my favorite topic is transportation. And this is a thank you to the county for listening to APS, as well as many of the parents in the neighborhood around Jefferson who asked that given the construction work that we're doing and the redirecting of traffic, it really brought to light the need for a four-way stop at this intersection. So as you see, the sign says new. There is a new stop sign. So everybody should be aware that that's now there and uh, to take care going down that street. And the families are very appreciative and very appreciative of the collaboration we have with the county that uh, made that happen. Uh, just to also note, last week we had the Joint Committee for Transportation Choices meeting, which is the joint staff meeting between the county and the schools, and we talked about everything from crosswalks to buses to maybe someday free bus service for students. And then most recently we had, uh, last night, the Arlington Committee for Transportation Choices, which is the... Um, uh, citizen Advisory Committee to the staff group and Mr. Goldstein went and they had a long presentation about how our bus systems work and how we might integrate those bus systems with of course free transportation for students. Do you think I have a point I keep trying to make with that? Anyway, so I wanted to say thank you very much to the county. They're being a great partner. We're trying very hard to make our systems uh, work together, but the more we can all work at um, making the streets safe for our students to walk and bike, the better, and we really appreciate this effort. Um, so that's that announcement on transportation. My second one is, Dr. Murphy, are you covering the dyslexia conference? No, uh, last Saturday, we had the first annual dyslexia conference, and it was a huge hit. Dr. Natras and her staff, Kelly Krug, was a huge planner in that. There were parents involved, uh, Kathleen Donovan. I could go on and on with all the names, but it was jam-packed, fabulous speakers, really motivating speakers, and I learned a lot, and I thought I knew a lot about this topic. The sessions I went to, I really found myself learning about practices for serving dyslexic students and how our staff is really deeply learning about that and integrating it in their work. So many, many thanks. I know it is the first of many to come, and I just really want to thank the staff for doing that. The parents were really, really grateful for that opportunity. Thank you. Dr. Murphy, do you have any announcements? Okay, I'm up. Good. Yes, Very you are. Good. I'll go ahead and piggyback on some of the comments there about the dyslexia conference. Again, a big thank you to uh, Dr. Natras, uh, but Kelly Krug, Kathleen Donovan, uh, Kelly Mountain, and then uh, Chloe Chin, as well as Donna Owens were uh, big uh, assets to that, as well as the SEPTA and ASAC folks uh, helped to organize that. So I'll uh, tag on to Ms. Van Dorn's comments there. I'm going to fold back. Uh, we're getting ready to uh, go through a little bit of uh, time change here. Uh, and while we you know, promote that, uh, the reality is that it's going to start to get dark around 5 o'clock. It's going to be a much lighter in the morning, though, when we come to school or come to work. So one of the things I uh, want to highlight, especially at this time of the year while we've been preparing for this, is to make sure for both students who are either walking or biking or um, you know, on their way to the bus stop or even traveling uh, in a car to make sure that they have a real awareness of their surroundings. Build in a little bit of extra time. I know uh, Monday morning will come quickly. Uh, we'll all be in a hurry, but I want to really emphasize this. Ms. Van Dorn pointed out the, the four-way stop, uh, and thank you to the county, especially the county manager, for facilitating that and moving that forward. But we want to make sure that safety is on everyone's mind as we kind of prepare here for a little bit of change uh, with the time and the day uh, and when we come and go to school and just have a general awareness out there about what things are happening. So encourage that conversation to happen this weekend. We're all looking forward, though, to the additional hour of uh, sleep on uh, Saturday evening into Sunday. 
We had the opportunity last week, uh, Ms. Talento and I had the opportunity with a group uh, from here from Arlington to travel to uh, the state capitol. And uh, there we were part of a group of 11 school divisions that were uh, recognized. There were over 129 school divisions that um, put forward uh, the, for these innovation grants, and we had two accepted one from Oak Ridge Elementary, and a shout out to uh, Dr. Lynn Wright for their Mosaic project, uh, as well as then for a collaboration between um, our Information Services Department, uh, Raj al and his team, and um, Chris Martini, and I think Chris has left, uh, but the um, uh, cybersecurity over at the Career Center, and they basically created uh, a sandbox or an artificial environment where the students in cybersecurity could explore different aspects of a network uh, and do that in a safe um, environment. So we were rec both of those uh, entities, Oak Ridge and the Department of Information Services and Career Center were recognized and you see a whole host of uh, people there with us, um, with the governor, and we were all very proud to be uh, a part of that. Uh, we also had our uh, school and community relations folks uh, recognized for the local chapter of uh, school public relations here, uh, the Chesapeake chapter, uh, and they were recognized for a variety of different publications uh, and um, events that we have produced, uh, most notably a news check, also the Citizen, which is a collaboration with the county, our Living Legends, uh, which were part of our Black History Month promotion, and then also um, part of the, uh, the budget uh, at a glance uh, that was produced by uh, Budget and Finance uh, for the proposed budget that I submitted last year. So uh, a shout out to School and Community Relations and that entire team as well as others that contributed to make that happen. Uh, last week at the middle and the elementary school level we had uh, parent teacher conferences and I just want to say thank you to our teachers and staff for that. Uh, many of them adjusted their schedules so that they could accommodate parent schedules for parents who were coming and going to work uh, and that worked out very well. Uh, we got some good feedback from that but I just want to recognize our teachers and staff uh, for the extra effort and accommodating schedules to make that happen and again we had some good turnout. It's that time of the year where we're coming to. We're already 25 percent of the uh, way through the school year. It's hard to believe uh, but we're also kind of assessing where we are and uh, how we're going to be moving forward at this time. So uh, Veterans Day is coming up here, and I need some help from the board members if they might be able to identify um, one or two individuals in this picture uh, and, um, you know, recognize um, many of our veterans here. This is, a, you know, a very historical um, um, moment here for our community, given that we have uh, many national monuments in our community recognizing our veterans and those that have served our, our country. Uh, but I do want to give a shout out to all our veterans who are on the school board, as well as part of our staff. And does anyone recognize anyone up there? I, I see one of our teachers there uh, in the top row from um, Arlington Science Focus. Uh, but does it, are there any other individuals we see there? <laughs> Dr. Murthy, I think Mr. Lander is up there second from the left on the bottom, correct? That might be Mr. Oh, Lander. I, I win. <laughs> there you go. So thank you, Mr. Lander, for your service to our country and all the other veterans that are here in Arlington. We have the uh, Girls' Color of Leadership uh, Conference coming up here uh, later in November. It's going to be hosted this year at Marymount University, and I want to encourage all girls who are interested in coming out and participating. You can talk with your principal at your middle school, or you can talk with your uh, school counselor. It is a very worthwhile event. We typically have anywhere from uh, two to 300 young ladies who participate on an annual basis. So if you're interested in something like this, we talk a lot about leadership. We talk a lot about future planning. We talk a lot about aspirations uh, for academic planning and career planning. And it is uh, uh, definitely a, 
uh, an action-packed Saturday, and usually by the end of the day, uh, the students as well as the adults that participate are exhausted. It really makes you think. We continue to uh, promote the idea that we are looking for uh, qualified bus drivers. Uh, we kind of are outlining some of the, uh, uh, you know, the salary there as well as the contractual time and the number of hours per week. You have seen we've got a variety of promotions from bumper stickers to yard signs to uh, other things out there, um, but we're increasingly trying to uh, build our bus driver um, cadre. Uh, and so if you know of somebody who wants a career, uh, there are opportunities here uh, with Arlington Public Schools. Uh, I'll also sort of reference uh, Mr. John Chadwick uh, and his uh, team uh, as far as getting in touch with him or through our HR department, Dr. Christy Murphy. Um, I know several weeks ago we had uh, some discussion in the community uh, about the uh, Career Center uh, and planning for the future. There is an uh, actually a an action or an information item on this a little bit later this evening, but I, I want to sort of have this information reside so it can be pointed to, and uh, also I've I've spoken to it on a number of occasions, but there seems to uh, be still some questions out there. So I thought if I addressed it through my announcements this evening, it could be something that if it comes up, people can kind of point to it, and uh, it is there, and it will reside on the uh, the board's information, but. Uh, one of the pieces is there is uh, a plan, uh, which is part of the CIP, to expand the number of seats that we have at the Career Center, and we'll be talking about that actually a little bit later. But coupled with that, Arlington Tech will continue to grow, and we're slated to have Arlington Tech this year grow by another 200 students, and that growth will continue until it reaches 800 students. So I want to make sure that folks know that enrollment there is um, going to continue to move in a forward direction, uh, and that is the plan as we move forward, and that's always been the plan. Uh, and uh, coupled with that, the uh, Arlington Community High School as well as the programs, uh, some of the uh, programs that are located at the Career Center, there are no plans uh, to relocate uh, any of those programs through 2022. Uh, and so I know there had, may have been some uh, information communicated in ERA about that in an earlier meeting this fall, and I just want to be uh, sure that we qualify that uh, and that we state that very clearly. I've shared that a couple of times, but I don't think I've uh, documented it like we have it here, so folks can point to that in the event that that question comes up. And uh, I know that Margaret Chung, I spoke with her today, she's the principal at the Career Center. She's continuing her um, you know, advocacy in recruiting students. I was also at High School Information Night uh, the other evening, and I know that the, both of their sessions were full with families who were interested in that. And today I was out at Gunston this morning visiting with Dr. Lori Wiggins, and as I traveled around, I actually uh, ran into a couple of students that I saw at the Washington Lee event and talked to them a little bit about Arlington Tech and their consideration about that. So we're really excited about seeing that program grow. It's slated to grow next year by uh, 200 students until it reaches a maximum of 800. Made mention that we're uh, to the end of the uh, uh, the grading period here. Uh, we've got just two days remaining, tomorrow and Monday, so uh, finishing up those projects or those final assignments or uh, anything that's outstanding. Uh, but uh, just a note to parents to be looking at the secondary level for report cards on November the 17th and then at the elementary level uh, November the 28th. And then finally, uh, Tuesday is election day. Schools are closed for students. That is a teacher uh, prep day. Uh, all of our central offices will be in, but I know many of you will be going out to a vote on election day. So we encourage that participation, um, and we hope to see you all out at the polls. Thank you. And of course, we have a budget work session Tuesday evening. We do. Of, of election day. Okay, we are now ready to act on our consent agenda. May I have a motion to adopt the consent agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes five to zero. We will now hear citizen comment on non-agenda items. First, I will read our speaker guidelines. 
The school board welcomes public comment. Generally, school board members do not respond to comments during the meetings. If they've not already signed up online, speakers must submit a speaker slip to the clerk before the agenda item they wish to speak on is called. Each speaker may speak for up to two minutes. There's a timer to help you keep track of your time and speakers should conclude their remarks when the buzzer sounds. All comments should address a matter related to Arlington Public Schools. Speakers should be courteous and address their comments to the entire school board. Speakers are called in the order in which they sign up. If you have written comments, please give them to the clerk. We ask that the audience please refrain from applauding. It does take a time from, it takes time away from the next speakers. Ms. Elliott, would you like to call the first speaker, please? Yes, ma'am. We have seven speakers tonight. Our first speaker is Thomas Simkin. Good evening. Uh, my name is Tom Senkin. My uh, daughter, Celeste, is a uh, sixth grader at Williamsburg, where I am a uh, PTA vice president. I'm here speaking in my personal capacity on uh, the subject of middle school boundary changes and specifically in support of grandfathering rising eighth graders when the new middle school boundary changes take effect. I'm here to advocate for eighth graders to be allowed to continue attending their present middle schools without switching to a new school. Uh, first, because disrupting their academic, social, and extracurricular networks would be needlessly harmful to their eighth grade experience. Also, forcing them to switch to a new school for eighth grade and yet another school for ninth grade would damage their sense of security and stability. Also, a one-year stay in a new middle school would leave eighth graders and their parents feeling detached, uninvested in the school, and perhaps even resentful. Uh, finally, eighth grade is an important year for children who are applying to high school programs of various sorts, such as TJ, and the move would have a severely negative impact on their competitiveness. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Our next speaker is Aaron Donahue. Good evening. My name is Aaron Donahue. I'm here on behalf of myself, my husband, and then my neighbors in planning block 16110. I'm here to speak about middle school boundaries. I have two daughters, Nora and Lena. We're a Tuckahoe family who lives behind East Falls Church Metro in a small planning block, 16110. We have been rezoned in both options to Williamsburg Middle School. We are asking that this please be reconsidered to allow us to stay at Swanson. Our planning unit is unfortunately already segregated by many major roads. 66 Lee Highway, Washington Boulevard, Sycamore, and the Metro. Currently, the WOND trail keeps our neighborhood accessible to Swanson and other Swanson neighborhoods and planning units. Students in our neighborhood choose daily to walk and bike to Swanson via the trail. A move to Williamsburg relegates our family and other families to numerous years of driving. Our neighborhood has one adjacent planning unit safely accessible by foot. 16140 will, we, will remain at Swanson, severing friendships made on buses, at neighborhood potlucks, and at Banneker Park. In addition, we worry about elementary rezoning. If we are rezoned to McKinley, we will be the only planning unit heading to Williamsburg. If we remain at Swanson, our students would transition to middle with peers from any possible elementary school. I'm urging you to please keep our planning unit at Swanson. Please keep the Falls Church Park neighborhood together. The accessibility on foot and assurance that our students will transition with peers is imperative to a successful middle school experience. Remaining at Swanson will afford my daughters the opportunity to build and maintain a diverse community of friends and learners from elementary to middle to high school. Thank you, I appreciate your time. And I do apologize, I'm gonna to need to step out to go put kids to bed. So thank you this evening. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is Dan Stern.
Evening board, Dr. Murphy. I'm here to talk about Boulevard Manor and the recent middle school changes to the planning unit. Our planning unit is 1303. Historically has gone to Ashlawn, split after into middle schools of Swanson and Kenmore, and then returned back at high school to Washington and Lee. During the recent high school redistricting, our planning unit, along with what looks like to be seven others, in reality, which are only three, because of those seven planning units, three of them are non-residential areas. So I don't really believe that they should be counted as part of the redistricting. Uh, so historically, we've all gone to Washington and Lee together. Our small planning unit is now redistricted to Yorktown High School from Kenmore. Only 10% of the Kenmore population will be going to Yorktown, so they'll be losing their friends. We talk about alignment. As part of the six considerations uh, for the, to guide the process and minimizing separation of small groups of students from their classmates when moving between schools, I think by only moving 10% of a middle school population to a high school that's over 22,000 kids is, is just not practical and not good for relationships to continue. I think we have options and opportunities because in review of all the redistricting through the middle class planning units, there were several areas that were split into groups where there are non-residential areas included as a planning unit, which I don't think should be included in the future. Uh, going forward for Boulevard Manor and my two children, I think we have an option to either make a choice for high school after Kenmore so that they can join friends back at Washington Lee or changing their middle school from Kenmore to Swanson, where there's 50% of that school goes and attends Yorktown. So they would have an opportunity to find and build more relationships. Thank you. Next, we have a pair of speakers, Julia Fangi and Emily Boggs. <laughs> My name is Emily, and my name is Julia. We are both in fifth grade. APS has some great schools, but one that stands out is Kenmore Middle School. Kenmore has an awesome arts program. We like how they incorporate arts into technology, math, science, and engineering. We have met the drama, band, orchestra, technology, and dance teachers. We also met the principal, and he is very kind. The choice of dance for PE is amazing. We met some students at Kenmore, and we liked it a lot. We felt very sad after in, in middle school information night when we heard that no one can transfer next year to Kenmore. We think Kenmore is a very unique and diverse and it is the right school for us. We think you should allow at least some students to transfer to Kenmore for sixth grade next year. Please vote to allow to have a lottery next year. We really want to be Cougars. Thank you. All right, next we have Linda Box. Good evening. Hi, I'm the proud mom of Emily Boggs. Um, and my other daughter, Olivia Boggs, is sitting, sitting over there um, with our neighbors, the Fangies, um, and Julia, who spoke up here a few minutes ago. I'm just here to sort of reiterate the request to allow transfers for middle school um, rising middle school students um, to apply to Kenmore. Our girls are extremely excited about the STEM program there and the art and science focus. Um, one of the reasons for moving to Arlington for my family has been the amazing education opportunities here in Arlington and really hoping that the girls can pursue their passion in art and science um, at the Kenmore Middle School. Uh, my understanding is that APS staff are concerned about the number of transfers and being able to handle that administratively. Um, it looks like less than 5% of the target population applied last year. And so, you know, we don't expect that it would be more than that this year and that it should be manageable. Um, we do think the benefit 
um, is really adding diversity to the Kenmore population and exposing our children from the Jamestown Elementary School to greater diversity. Um, the tour was just amazing that the girls took and some of the things that they're doing there in terms of raising money for Puerto Rico and other um, amazing things that we want to expose our children to. So um, the also I just a quick comment is that I was really struck by the disproportion of boys that presented during the robotics presentation. Um, as a partner at Deloitte Consulting, I'm super sensitive to that. We have a lot of initiatives about women in technology. And so um, these are girls here that are really interested in a science program and would love to see um, more girls have the opportunity to start pursuing greater exposure to science at a young age. So I hope you will consider. Thank you. Thank you. Our final speaker is Gabriela Uro. Good evening, board, superintendent, senior staff. My name is Gabriela Uro, and I'm a parent of two bright young women who attend Wakefield High School. I have over 30 years of experience in education policy at the state and federal level focused on advancing equity and, op for opp and opportunities and experiences for underserved students. I work with 70 of the nation's largest urban school districts and for the past nine years I've had the privilege and opportunity to share some of that knowledge and best practices with Arlington Public Schools on the numerous committees that the community has. As much as I love data and research, tonight I'm not going to give you much of that. <laughs> I'm going to merely cite some of the references I have in the written comments for you. Tonight I speak to you as a parent who's from an ethnic background that is being stereotyped and unfairly condemned by leaders and the public. I personally know what it feels like to have others say that my children and family are a detriment to schools and society. Unfortunately, for the past year, this message has been heard many times in Arlington's community about children of color and children and families with limited means. Two references in my written remarks are important rebuttals to this narrative. One is the achievement data that is produced by Virginia Department of Education that shows that in some of Arlington schools where the economically disadvantaged students make up a significant share, they are outperforming their counterparts and other schools that have lower concentrations of such children. The second one has to do with the body of research that shows the detrimental effects on students who are socioeconomically marginalized at school. One such study that's provided to you in citation looked at the adverse impact on academic achievement of adolescents. The percentage of economically disadvantaged students is irrelevant to students' success. The final citation I give you in my remarks is an article that identified what school leaders do to ensure that underdeserved students thrive in their schools. They focus their leadership on issues of equity and justice. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. All right. Thank you all so much for coming out. Um, and just to remind you all, there um, we are still listening to and taking comments as well as the staff as as um, we refine the boundary uh, recommendations that we've received so far. And um, I know that Dr. Murphy, you have in your um, next presentation some comments about the, where we are with middle school transfers. Um, if those who spoke on that subject, maybe do, do you want to um, say a quick word now or, or you, you, can you guys sit through one presentation and just get a quick update? You don't have to, of course. But, but since we're talking about that, um, I think that would be, get, get everyone on the same page on that. Um, so with that, again, thank you all so much for coming out. We will move on to our next item, which is a monitoring item, the superintendent's update on the 2017-2018 action plan. Dr. Murphy. Thank you, Dr. Cannon, uh, and I'm going to have uh, some assistance this evening. We're going to go through uh, the 2017-18 uh, action plan uh, and a little bit more detail this evening about where we are and uh, the different activities that are happening and also kind of forecast uh, ahead what things are happening out there. Uh, as we've seen just by some of the comments uh, this evening and some of the things that we've been talking about, uh, our enrollment growth continues to uh, expand. Uh, we also see that many of the things that we, projects that we are moving forward 
forward with are complex and overlapping. And at the end of all of this, we are trying to create the best learning experiences and environments for kids. So we keep that uh, out there on the horizon as some in the direction that we are headed. Uh, what we've done uh, this evening is to lay out the, the various projects and initiatives that we have uh, and sort of identify uh, with the first cut where we are as far as how they're moving along. So with the options and transfers, uh, for instance, we're going to follow that up a little bit later on, but we are indicating that we're completed on that. With acceptable use and school facility naming, you're going to hear a little bit about those, and we are, have actually launched those. The middle school boundaries is in process, and we've got that coming back on November um, the 14th for a recommendation. And then you'll hear this evening from uh, Ms. Pilch about where we are in process with the Montessori move. When we look at some of the others, uh, Dr. Cannon and you made in your opening remarks, I believe, that we kicked off the strategic planning process. So you hear from Dr. Natras a little bit about that. We've got these others that are slated with the, uh, the budget, and there are some community meetings that folks should be looking for. We have the, uh, the AFSAP that's coming a little bit later in November, and then in the spring we'll be seeing the capital improvement. And then finally, with capital initiatives, uh, we are beginning the Career Center in process, and that is an information item. You're also going to hear about the Ed Center a little bit later, and then we've already begun the Reed Building with the kickoff of the Building Level Planning Committee, which is, which is in process. Much of this information is uh, continually updated and provided on our Engage website. So you can simply go to Engage and then click on the upper left-hand corner of the tab, and then all of those particular projects will array. Uh, and then all of the information about calendar, about timelines, about where we are, and any other documentation that exists is there. Uh, and I, I will just say staff is working very diligently to keep that refreshed. But if there was a meeting held or something that's coming up, it may take a, about a 24-hour cycle to get some of that information up. So please just be patient with us as we uh, continue to try and move through this. Uh, one of the, um, the first elements uh, that I think we want to talk a little bit about more in detail uh, this evening that I've already outlined uh, has to do with the acceptable uh, acceptable use, and I'm going to turn to uh, Dr. Natras to talk to you a little bit about where we are with that. I think at the last meeting I talked to you about that we had rolled out here the first part of the fall some interim guidance given that we had not been able to move forward with the acceptable use, but I would like her to speak a little bit about where we are with the one-to-one, -one, the timeline, uh, and then what the interim guidance speaks with. So Dr. Natras. Good evening. Um, so one of the projects that is slated to start shortly is our work around the acceptable use policy, really talking about the work with digital devices within our schools. And so you see the actions and kind of the timeline for that work. We have developed interim guidance for technology use, and Dr. Murphy alluded to that at our meeting a couple of weeks ago as well, so I'm going to share that this evening. We will have our first community engagement meeting around this work on November 15th, where we will share with the community some of the elements of acceptable use policies, get some input from them on the key ideas within that to then bring back to an internal staff team to draft the policy to then go back out to the community to get additional input. That additional input will be gathered between December 8th and January 3rd. We don't actually have the date yet for the community meeting, but we will get that out once we have it. And then it is slated to come for a school board information item on January 4th with action on January 18th. So the interim guidance that has been provided to all of our schools as we are working through the acceptable use policy can be seen here. We've looked at things somewhat by grade level as well as holistically K-12. So a couple of the key kind of issues that have been risen throughout the community over the last um, conversations around this have to do with things like devices at recess and lunch. So part of our guidance is that we will not use devices at recess or lunch, including indoor recess. We also have had a lot of conversation about the apps that are being downloaded onto iPads and being used. 
This summer, we revamped that process, and there is an apps request process um, that includes vetting for privacy, student data, as well as instructional purpose. So we've done quite a bit of narrowing of the apps that students have access to. And then we also looked at homework, and a couple of the guidelines around homework really are to align it with our current policies. So time spent, whether it's with a digital device or not, um, for homework will not exceed the maximum amount of time in our homework policy. Devices will come home with a specific assignment communicated, um, and additional requests could be considered for an instructional purpose because we know there are some students who really um, need that device home with them every evening, and so we didn't want to have anything in there that prevented that from happening, so this allows for some of that work and then k-12 committing to that our devices are used for active learning experiences and they're not used for recreation or entertainment throughout the day so this is the guidance that's in place as we begin that conversation around the um, acceptable use policy in a couple of weeks the other piece that falls into, I believe this is group one of all of our work with new policies, is the school naming criteria, and Linda is going to speak to that. Thank you, Dr. Nactris. Very quickly, um, we ha are in the process of putting together, finishing putting together the staff committee, but we also felt that we needed some outside support for this process, so we have been in several conversations with the George Mason University Arlington campus uh, the School for Conflict Analysis and, and Resolution. Um, they will be working with us and doing, um, they're writing the surveys right now that will be administered this month. Um, there will be one survey to students in the schools, uh, to all APS staff, and then there'll be a community survey to families, alumni association members, and the general community. Then as follow-up and to dig deeper on what they hear on the surveys, they will be doing focus groups uh, at the end of November with um, students over the lunch period at all of our high schools, and then we'll have uh, several days um, uh, with options of times for the community to come in and do focus groups with them and, and share their feedback. They're hoping to have a report to us in early December so that the staff committee can review that and we're hoping that if we can get it to you not before the winter break immediately after the winter break so that's where we are with that dr murphy yes thank you miss Ertis. so now we're going to move to uh, group two and i think uh, thank you for the young ladies for staying back and uh, families who were on uh, non-agenda items talk a little bit about uh, middle school boundaries uh, and also the montessori move uh, let me recap uh, where we are with uh, the middle school boundary process. We've just come out of the uh, what we've heard community meetings and the next steps slated for uh, November 8th is uh, we're going to be posting the proposed boundary options to the Engage website. As I made mention, I'll be coming uh, with my recommendation on November the 14th. There is a public hearing then on November 30th. That's part of the school board meeting that evening. Uh, and then the board is slated to take action on December the 14th on those items. Uh, there was some concern expressed uh, about middle school transfers, and so we've gone back and we've looked at that. I want to state that we advocate for the opportunity for students to transfer for many of the reasons that were stated, uh, the different interests of students, the different programs that we have, providing opportunities so students can be successful. So we want to continue to look at that. Um, it's also been a tool in our toolbox to provide the opportunities for students to seek other opportunities and also for us to look at how we uh, serve students. We though need to review uh, the transfer options in relationship to what the final decision is in relationship to the boundary process. So after the boundary process closes in uh, mid-December, we'll be coming back out after the first of the year and determining the extent of transfers that, that we can exercise and then be communicating how that process will roll and giving families enough time for that consideration. So thank you for being patient with us. I think, again, we value the fact that transfers are an asset to our community, and that's why we see our students uh, being so successful. And we recognize that we do have an array of opportunities across our middle schools and our high schools, uh, and making those opportunities available to students, I think, is um, part of why we are so successful here in Arlington. 
All right, I want to turn to uh, Ms. Pilch, who's been working directly with uh, the Montessori move and have her talk a little bit about where we are with uh, this process, the engagement we've been having with the community, and uh, then possible next steps. Good evening. I've been fortunate enough to be working with the Montessori planning team, and we have a group of about 20 um, parents, administrators, Montessori teachers from both our public and private Montessori's, and we have met um, now three times, and covering a variety of topics, starting with looking at our goals to having a speaker who has a background in Montessori configurations and looking at which grade levels um, make the most sense to be included together. Um, there have been great discussions. We met last night and actually did a tour of the Henry site, and um, Annie Turner was there, and we spoke a lot about the facilities, and we also discussed some possible configurations of numbers of kids that might fit in the building. Um, and as we're starting to look at our recommendations um, to the Department of Teaching and Learning, the group also created a feedback questionnaire, which you can find on the Engage site under Community Feedback. So that is open for any families, um, previous and current Montessori students or any community members that would like to give some input. Uh, that'll be open until Sunday evening and we'll be meeting, actually we've added an additional meeting next Wednesday so that we can look at uh, the final results of the feedback questionnaire and look at our moves um, that we would like to present to the Department of Teaching and Learning on November 15th and then to you all on December 14th. So Dr. Natras now, I believe. Okay, so moving on to our operational planning um, section of the projects on which we're working, there are three elements that are underway within this particular section. The strategic plan, the fiscal year 19 budget, which has several events coming up, as you can see here, November 16th, the Spanish Community Forum, November 28th, a community forum, and then December 5th, the Arlington Civic Federation. We also are continuing our work on AFSAP, as well as the CIP framework, and November 28th, we will have a work session on that. In addition, we also have quite a few things that are happening with the strategic plan. So. You can see here some of the work that's been done. We did have our first steering committee meeting this past Monday evening, and Ted Black and Meredith Purple facilitated that meeting with our committee, and things went really well. You can hear uh, Meredith Purple in her podcast that I believe was emailed out in a school talk yesterday um, talking about the process, so you can learn more about it through that podcast, and then you can see our upcoming steering committee meetings. November 16th, we will be looking at those practices in education that align with the hopes and aspirations that we've been gathering from the community since September 23rd. There's been an online questionnaire that will continue through November 15th, and we've been asking the same three questions as we go out to a variety of meetings. Um, we did this activity last night at the Advisory Council on Instruction meeting. Um, we did it at a Kenmore Parent meeting a couple of weeks ago, I believe a Saturday or so ago. Um, and several other events. And then November 27th, we will do our external scan where we're looking at what's happening within APS, our local, state, and national areas, both with education as well as with things such as jobs and other areas that will impact our work with the strategic plan. And then on December 5th, we will be working with the steering committee on mission, vision, and core values. Following that meeting, we'll be coming out to the community to gather additional input, and then we'll come back to the steering committee. And if you'd like to get the whole calendar of events for the course of the year, that is also on the Engage page, and everyone can see when is the steering committee working, when do things go back out to the community, when does the steering committee work, when do things go back out, and kind of see that give and take as we move through the process. And finally, we have um, our capital initiatives, and I'm going to turn things back over to Dr. Murphy to talk about those. So I mentioned we're going to see actually the first two of these um, later this evening as um, 
items and uh, the Reed building is already in motion with uh, the BLPC. So um, more to come on both of these a little bit later this evening. Just remind folks about Engage. I think there's a wealth of information out there. We will continue to work diligently to keep that updated and current, uh, but um, just be aware that a lot of the documents and the information will continue to reside there and we get good feedback on that. We also have a process where if folks write into Engage, we, uh, we respond um, you know, pretty promptly to questions or issues that folks raise. So that's also a good communication vehicle and cycle. So continue to send your comments, your ideas, uh, your thoughts to engage so we can uh, respond to those. So I will stop there if uh, there are questions or particular items the board either wants to highlight or Thank underline. You. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. And for the whole team for that, all that participation. Um, first, let me ask uh, Ms. Elliott, do we have speakers? No speakers. Uh, so board colleagues, questions, comments? Ms. Van Dorn. I have a question regarding the one-to-one -one devices. I heard a lot on Saturday at the dyslexia conference about students who, with disabilities who have difficulty regarding the apps that they specifically need. And while I certainly appreciate wiping things off that shouldn't be on the devices, I heard two uh, issues. One was now with our rigorous process for approving apps, it's taking too long for them to get access to those apps and then that they specifically need. And then secondly, even though they have the device for three or four, three years in middle school or four years in high school, that um, in the summer the apps get wiped off and they have to start again. So that's really a, a problem for them. And then there are some very specific apps that they need that they really need quickly. Mm -hmm. So could you maybe address that? Or I hope you're aware sure. of that and mm -hmm. working on it. Um, so a couple of things. One is that we are really committed to making sure that that rigorous apps process that we're using for all students um, can be bypassed for special education or special needs students when someone requests it, right? So if someone says this child needs X app, um, it's part of their IEP or 504, they just need that accommodation. Um, we're working to make sure we provide that much more quickly than the other process that's in place. There was actually a meeting today um, with our IS folks as well as our special education staff to work together on how do we get that message out to teachers so they know don't go through this other process, do this, and we'll get it much more quickly than we are. So we're working what, to What should parents do if they feel that needs to get resolved and maybe there isn't quite that understanding yet by the teaching staff, what, what should they do? I would, if they've gone to the teacher and it's not working through, I would actually talk with the ITC at the okay. school or their special education case manager. One of those two can okay. help work Great. through it um, with the IS team. Anyone else? Uh, Mr. Lento. So thank you for the update, I really appreciate it. Um, I had some questions on communication uh, and some logistics. Do we have a location for the November 15th community engagement meeting on acceptable use? Washington Lee. Okay, perfect. And has the APS school talk or what have we, has anything gone out um, or just so that um, we can inform the public mm -hmm. to be informed of that meeting or when can we expect that to go out? I think tonight is the initial message and then we'll be sending out school talks and other things. Perfect. We didn't want it to get lost in all of the I other know, projects, so it's like every two weeks here are the next upcoming meetings Great. for the community. Well, that's helpful yep. because yeah. um, I know that we discussed this at the last mm -hmm. time, the last meeting, yeah. and we're doing so well with strategic plan. I've seen all of the, you know, I got the podcast one, I saw here's your chance, to surveys online, yep. middle school mm -hmm. doing really well. Mm -hmm. So my next question is the same for the Montessori move. Um, I think there's a feedback questionnaire. Will that be going now? APS that school talk as well in the same cycle, the, the two weeks, because that closes Sunday I, night. Sunday. Sunday so, night. So we, that Most of the um, communications for the Montessori mm -hmm. have that gone um, either through AMAC or if they've asked us for assistance, then we can. Okay. All right, so this is an opportunity to tell the public, please respond if you have any concerns or issues with Montessori closes Sunday night. Um, and then the last one I think was uh, the budget forms. Do we know if those school talks have gone out? And I'm, I'm just gonna try to remind, I know we have a lot going on, so I just want to, 
take the opportunity yeah. at the school meeting to announce to everyone and then I think what we're trying to do and if we need to adopt another strategy uh, we're open to that we're trying not to overpace people with okay. information and flood them uh, but on the other hand give them enough of a, a preview or a think ahead and I think that was the purpose of tonight's okay, presentation as, as well is to sort of forecast it's coming it's coming and then um, I know school and community or the other vehicles that we have for communicating then getting those messages and pushing those things out so it's not right on top of people so we're trying to keep a pace if folks are telling us they need a faster pace then we can accelerate that but oftentimes those meetings overrun each other and then uh, we kind of uh, confound the schedule so no, and, and that, I appreciate that yeah so, that's our strategy now but if we hear differently uh, or we need to accelerate that we'll we'll do that well if there is a way to advise us when it's going out because then we can be a support system to that mm -hmm. messaging when we go out to our PTAs and civic okay. associations and communities if I know that they're going to be going out, I can say look out for these school talks on budget or okay. because um, as we're meeting with different community members, we have the opportunity to share mm -hmm. that type of information. So right. I just was helpful to me to understand where we were on these three pieces because I haven't seen it and uh, I'm going to be at some of my liaison meetings next week. So I thought I would take the opportunity to say you should have gotten this. Go back to your APS school talk yeah. emails or it's coming yeah. and keep keep an eye out. So however you guys can. Uh, share that information with us would be very helpful to me. Yeah, and Murphy, um, I was going to add that our, our staff have been, because we're trying to bundle things together, yeah. um, Thursdays are pretty much designated as engaged Thursdays. So you will notice that today you, you received an, uh, a school talk message that out, outlined um, a number of engagement opportunities coming up. And the same thing will happen next Thursday and the next one and the next one as we work through the year. So that's the other um, hint is to tell people to really sort of look for those Thursday messages. Okay, so hint. Thursday is our special date for Th engaged, how to engaged Thursday. Okay, engaged Thursdays. <laughs> thank All you. Right. I'll also note um, that I know that uh, from the school board office, they push out social media about a number of these pieces on a regular basis because I get that on my Twitter feed. Coupled with, I know. Um, Several meetings ago, it came up when the APS school talk came out, and there might be three topics listed. If you've noticed how the APS school talks are now designed, uh, and you'd only see one topic if you'd open up your email um, now because they've included a graphic on there. I don't know if all of you have seen the fact that they're inc including graphics that are related to the topics. Now you can see a variety of different elements that are part of that particular email. So it just doesn't look like there's one topic uh, involved in the email. Um, so Mr. Goldstein, I think actually you raised that, um, that issue. So uh, I don't know if you'll note the graphics, uh, the graphic layout it will hopefully catch people to see there's more information on there. Thank you. I appreciate that. Very responsive and innovative. Um, Ms. Van Doren, you had, had a follow-up comment to this conversation. This is going to be so micromanaging. <laughs> but many of us have worked very hard to communicate messages to promote action, like around November 7th. And uh, I'll just say that, I mean, I, I, when, every, when, when people get a message from APS School Talk, and that's all they see. And I know that we're, we're fighting for space and time, but I would just suggest that somehow we not just have a picture, but I'd, li I'd love to see us perfect that because I'm not sure that people are getting easily the message about what's coming up and how fast it's coming up, and maybe we can talk about that. I just, I Usually they don't get just a picture. They get, um, if there are images used, they get a small image, the headline, and usually the first sentence to uh, sentence or two and then a link that they can go for more uh, to read the full thing yeah, I'm, I'm looking at a couple right now but right. it's 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 complicated and the stuff gets lost so I'm mm -hmm. I'm sure that, that we can put our minds to that because the the issue I have is that we have so many things going at once that I love the idea that there's one day of the week mm -hmm. but rather than it saying APS school talk engage with us really this week one-to-one -one, boom boom in one sentence to grab people's attention because there's so much verbiage about APS Engage, APS School Talk, that I think people are just scrolling past that. So 
as I said, I'm sorry I'm getting into the weeds here, but mm -hmm. we've we'll, all been in the situation we'll, where we we'll, have to move people. We'll and go back. Sometimes we'll go, it's, they only read the headline. Yeah, we'll go back and, and, and look at some of that. I, I hear what you're saying, sort of topical. Mm -hmm. Mr. Lander? I had a question about this Montessori schedule. If I remember correctly, we had discussed having a work session with that to go over. Um, so, um, I don't believe there was a work session, but every session has been open to the public, um, and we've had we've had multiple um, members of the public come to each session. But I, we, yeah, we didn't have a work session planned on. I think, Mr. Lander, you may be referencing. I believe on there, I noted that there is a that is a monitoring item uh, slated for December 14th. Right, but I, 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 we can go, I'm remembering. We can go back uh, and take a look at it. Right, I, I, I thought our discussion centered around prior to making a move, the board would look at costs per pupil. They would look at some of the other things from a decision-making standpoint, from a policy standpoint associated okay. with um, the move. And I th thought we had discussed having a work session on that. So um, it's not listed, and it uh -huh. just sort of, when I saw C is listed for a monitoring item on the 14th. I was like, oh, well, when, when, is, when is that work session scheduled? So I'll follow up in weekly meeting. Okay. Right. We have a, our budget work session. We could do it. Uh, it's a very full agenda, but we're doing sort of cost per pupil type stuff. So that might, might fit in. Um, and we also have a uh, work session on elementary boundaries, which is probably also a very full agenda. Um, so those would be potential spots um, for now. But we can talk about it. I, I didn't know you'd like to have more work sessions. So we'll, we'll, we'll look at our calendars and yeah. Okay, let's, we'll, we'll consider that. Uh, everyone all set? Okay, um, I just wanna thank you very much, um, especially for being so responsive. I know the idea of the interim guidance kind of came up in conversations around the board and um, um, you know you guys you guys did it and it's very practical the kind of advice that I think the community has been asking for or guidance that the community has been asking for and um, I think that's that's really terrific um, I also wanted to follow up just on the Montessori piece just to make sure everyone does understand the process from here um, and Ms. Elliott and I had actually gone back to look at the history very quickly we did vote when we did um, a motion on locating what is now Fleet Elementary. We, at that point in our motion, took the first three recommendations from the South Arlington Working Group, one of which was then, as after um, building the new elementary school, to then move the Montessori program to the current Patrick Henry building. So that was a motion that we voted on um, last April, April 2016. So um, that has already been approved, that, that move. And so that's why I believe, and I'm kind of confirming this with you all to make sure we all understand the process from here. At this point, there is not a school board decision to be made. We have made it. You're bringing, this, you're bringing us a monitoring item to tell us what's going on with it and what grades you're recommending, which really is not a school board decision. That's sort of just like a definition of the program. Right. Um, is that basically, does that make sense to everyone? And, and that's, that's kind of how I, I think we're planning to proceed from here. Right, that's what we outlined, I believe, when we brought this forward this summer. Okay. Okay, I think so. All, All right. right. I'll turn to Dr. Natras to, okay. for the next um, item on professional learning. Professional learning, yes. Professional development. Yes. yes. All right. So as we continue through our evening, we are going to talk about professional learning within APS. And Dr. Sarber and I are going to provide some updates with where we are specifically with several of the recommendations that were made in the program evaluation, as well as some of the other work we're doing that came up a lot in discussion last year as well with this work. Before I introduce Dr. Sarber, I do also want to thank our human resources team. Um, while we are presenting this information, it is definitely a team effort um, with human resources, as well as with a lot of staff within the Department of Teaching and Learning. So I'm gonna turn things over to Dr. Sarber to set the stage, and then we'll share some additional information shortly. 
So good evening, Madam Chairman and Chairwoman and School Board. Um, I'm here to provide an update on professional learning in Arlington Public Schools. So we thought we'd start with um, a reminder of the purpose of professional learning. Um, the whole point of professional learning is to advance educators' practice and in order to improve student achievement. And so we utilize the cycle of improvement to do that work. And so centered on student learning, we take a look at the student performance. And then we identify adult learning goals based upon those student goals and we look at strategies that would address those needs. We engage in professional learning around that. We implement those strategies. We offer feedback and guidance and follow-up around the implementation of those strategies. And then we revisit, what does the student learning look like? And so we engage in this cycle um, for individual development, as well as team and school improvement, as well as countywide for program implementation. And so that really seeks, we seek a balance between these three ideas that staff will engage in professional learning on three different levels for themselves. So it might be that myself as a classroom teacher say, you know, um, kids are really having a hard time with fractions this year, so I need to beef up my skills there and look at what other ways I can help them. As a team in my school, we might say, you know, we really see this area of need of maybe problem solving with our group this year. What are we gonna do about it? And how can we track that student data and do some things different in our practice? And a school might do that as well. Their school level data might tell them some things that they need to engage in differently. As well as for program evaluation. So that would be a countywide type of thing. For example, in our math office, implementing math workshop across the district. And as we plan professional learning, we keep in mind these goals and that we want staff to be engaged in meaningful work, that the professional development that they're engaging in um, applies to what they need to do with students and that we acknowledge that they come to us with experiences and backgrounds and things that they might already know and could contribute to the knowledge base of the whole school system and that it's goal-oriented and competency-based, and that we allow staff the autonomy for voice and choice to acknowledge their previous experiences and the things that they know that they need to go into deeper. That we have this really clear purpose around what the professional learning is there for, and that we have these varied professional learning formats so that it's not all just face to face. There's some when you need it, there's some going really in depth, and there's some on an overview level. And so we have some data to take a look at since our program evaluation. This table shows the hours of participation in professional learning across our four um, pay scales over the past seven years. And in addition, the survey data that we give at the end of each session has shown that 87% of attendees either agree or strongly agree that the session met their needs and that they're going to implement something that they learned. And this has remained steady over the past seven years. So some highlights in our data points in this past year. We have 245 mentors assigned to new teachers. We have 83 new teacher mentors, so they've engaged in training around how to mentor new staff. We have 93, 98 university students who've been placed in our classrooms and are working with teachers around new practices. We have, have had over 773 sessions in ERO. That's our online catalog, and that's an increase since the past year. And we've had over, we've had 85 national board candidates, and that's our largest group yet to this year. This, um, that's our largest group yet overall. And so um, Dr. Natras is gonna go over our recommendations and next steps. 
Thank you, Dr. Sarber. In the last program evaluation, there were several recommendations on which we've been working. Um, you can see the three recommendations on the left-hand side. One was an aligned and coordinated system. Another is the looking at our professional learning delivery models. And the third was really building voice and choice within professional learning. And so we've been addressing a lot of these things, and you can see the action steps to date. We have been working when we talk about that aligned and coordinated system in what really are our areas of focus for professional learning and how do we build that balance that Dr. Sarber was talking about for individuals, thinking about the needs of grade level or content teams, and then also thinking about the needs of the division overall based on what our data is telling us. And so we have spent time drafting a professional learning framework for teachers that align with our teaching and learning goals and also align with the teacher evaluation standards. And we created a draft of the professional learning framework and then we worked with different groups like the Teachers Council on Instruction to get feedback from them on what are the kinds of things that you are looking for when we talk about professional learning. Is this the kind of scope and sequence we want? So one of our key goals was how do we create this really aligned system within the framework? The other piece with that coordinated system is the single system of record. So um, Dr. Sarber referenced earlier the ERO is where our teachers as well as other staff go to enroll in whatever their course may be or the session that they're attending for professional learning may be. And we are currently getting underway with a request for proposals to see if there is a system that can also blend with several of our other resources so there's a one-stop kind of shop for that. Another piece is the professional learning delivery models and thinking about how do we engage people in professional learning? What does that look like? And so we have developed a variety of ways within the system for people to build that learning. Face-to-face -face sessions, online sessions, as well as blended learning sessions. This does not address things like coaching and support in the classroom by math coaches, a reading specialist, or Department of Teaching and Learning staff, nor things like I go out to a conference or I'm taking a graduate course or um, another you know, course to build my repertoire outside of um, APS. What this really talks about are our sessions that you'll see within the professional learning framework in just a moment. We are also really looking at what that delivery entails on certain days that have been set aside in the calendar for professional learning. So on the August day of learning that we had on August 29th, as teachers were coming back to school, we were able to offer a variety of ways in which to gain that professional learning. Some teachers did online sessions, others came to face-to-face -to -face sessions, and so they had choice not just in topic, but also in how, what's the delivery mode for this going to look like. And then most recently, we had the October early release last Wednesday right before conferences that was slated for a professional learning day. And in that, teachers had the choice of coming to a face-to-face -face session that afternoon or doing an online module or a blended module that has to be completed by November 17th. So we know that the Wednesday before conferences, when you're getting ready for all-day conferences, Thursday and Friday, it may be challenging to do a two-hour face-to-face professional learning session. And so we provided teachers with the flexibility for if you want to get ready for conferences, if you want to um, finish your grades or whatever you need to do to prepare, as long as you've done an online module by the middle of November, you've met that requirement. And then I've spoken to this already a little bit with those options, but having voice and choice in professional learning in both topic as well as in how um, the delivery model is provided. And Festival of the Minds is another example of that where we have lots of different topics taking place. So I'm excited to share with you tonight um, the launch of our professional learning framework. So Dr. Sarber is going to pass out a hard copy of this for you. These are also screenshots, um, but it's nice to have a paper copy as we talk about this. One of our key goals was to connect our professional learning to our key areas of focus. And our key areas of focus within the Department of Teaching and Learning have to do with connecting, creating, and innovating. And so when we talk about connecting, we're talking about things like inclusion and whole child for our students, connecting students across the board as well as connecting with things beyond academics, right, for the whole child's work. 
and then connecting adults through professional learning communities and through our curriculum. In order to create really authentic and engaging learning experiences for our students focused on the five C's, so critical and creative thinking, collaboration, communication, as well as citizenship. And then from there, really innovating um, within our work. And through that, we're looking at personalized learning. We have our personalized learning design teams running um, in 17 of our schools, as well as the profile of a graduate work. So this is the framework under which our professional learning is occurring. What you see here then are the four phases of understanding. So when you think about professional learning, it kind of goes through this progression of what do teachers need to know and be able to do. And so the first stage to this or phase to this is building the infrastructure for teaching and learning. What are those foundational elements? So if we want to have inclusive environments for all of our students, what are the foundational elements that all teachers need to know in order to provide that kind of environment? And then from there, what is the content knowledge I need to have? So if I'm teaching math, sometimes why we divide fractions is a, or how we divide fractions is a really challenging thing to teach. So I may need to go deeper with my math content. And then once I've got that solid foundation, how do I enhance that within my classroom? How do I use data to support students um, as well as lots of other things? And then how do I lead others in this, right? So we've got experts throughout our classrooms. How do we provide that learning and support um, across the board for others? Now, when you look at this, you see on the back, and no one um, can probably read this slide, but I wanted to show that each one of those areas we talked about, like inclusion, there's a definition for inclusion, and then you see the sessions or modules that align with that. So under building the infrastructure of teaching and learning, we have modules on ATSS, collaborative teaching with instructional assistants, co-teaching models, introduction to gifted learners, understanding dyslexia, um, understanding IEP goals, accommodations, and strategies. So those are the foundational elements when we talk about building inclusive environments. And then you can see how that builds to content knowledge, builds to enhancing teaching and learning, and then builds into leading others. It does not mean that every teacher has to do everything on this list, right? So we hire some teachers who are already experts in a lot of these things, or we have teachers in APS who have been in APS for 20 years who are experts in these things. So they would jump in and out of each one of these elements based on what their needs are and based on their demonstration of mastery and proficiency in these areas. And you can see how that builds then for each of our other areas of focus. And then on the front, the other piece you saw were the different formats for how these things um, will be rolled out with our teachers and how they'll access these different modules and sessions and learning opportunities from face-to-face -to, -face to blended learning, which is really a mix of face-to-face -face as well as online learning, and then our online modules. So it's very exciting. All right, so what are our next steps? A uh, few things. One, um, between now and next fall, I've talked about this as the um, professional learning framework for teachers, right? This is the teacher piece. We know when we saw this in the data that Dr. Sarber showed earlier that we need to have frameworks like this for all of our staff. So when we think about what is it that we want all of our bus drivers to know and be able to do? What is it that we want all of our um, administrative assistants to know and be able to do? What about our teaching assistants? What about our principals and assistant principals? And so we will be working with human resources over the course of the next year to work with those groups um, to build a very similar framework that has that same kind of progression that focuses on the same things for all of our staff. I talked earlier about the request for proposals for a single system of record. Our goal is to have that completed by this spring um, for the professional learning opportunities. We are, I mean, you saw in that professional learning framework all of those different modules. Some of them already exist and are online ready to go, and we use them at elementary early release. Others have to be developed. So the online and blended learning modules will be a lot of the work we're doing. We've met with various groups because what we're really trying to do with these is harness the expertise within our classrooms. So having teachers develop the modules for other teachers, having various groups like our um, cultural competence team looking at what we're doing with culturally responsive pedagogy, that will be a lot of the upcoming work. 
And then again, that voice and choice piece is working with the other staff on what are the kinds of things that you see in a framework for your work um, that we want all of our staff to know and be able to do. So that is all. If you have any questions or comments, we are happy to address them. Awesome. First, let's see if we have any speakers. We do have one speaker on this, Ms. Okay. Ingrid Gant. All right. <clears throat> to Dr. Cannon and members of the school board, superintendent and the executive leadership team and all assembled, good evening. My name is Ingrid Gant. I'm the president of the Arlington Education Association, speaking tonight as an individual. As I reflect on professional learning, I'm excited to see some of the updates and many times we always give a one-sided picture of what we want to paint. However, I contend in order to create, connect, and innovate, we have to reflect on things that have challenged us or things that didn't go over so well. So looking at the professional learning, as we speak about utilizing our staff and teachers' experience and expertise to bring new learning, are we really doing that? The answer is no. And if we are doing that, then it's not consistent. When we're speaking about the goal-oriented and autonomy in which people have control over their work, are we really doing that? And I contend again, the answer is no. And if we are, it's not consistent. And lastly, are we providing a clear purpose to support a balance of very opportunities for professional learning formats? And are we doing that? My answer would be yes, but is that consistent? So our professionals are hired because of you. You hired them for their ability to teach. Simply put, they are good at what they do. Our ESPs are hired in a support role to do what they do. Why is it that we can look at the whole child? Why is it that we can look at what the teachers need to be developed, a high quality staff, yet we only look at our teachers to provide mentors, yet our new ESPs have to learn by trial and error. So I'm excited when we're talking about what the next steps are. But when we look at the whole classroom, we're not looking at we're only dealing with these students at one time. So why are we doing that to our educators? When looking at the August Day of Learning, APS continues to promote a lack of trust, I believe, to show our teachers. Tell me I can sign up for a workshop online and then send me an email the day before that says I have to do it in the APS property. Professional learning is something we should all work towards achieving, and AP AEA thanks you for your time. I hope you look to us when we're looking at doing what's best for our educators. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, board colleagues, questions or comments? Ms. Van Dorn. Thank you. Thank you for that comprehensive uh, look at this. It's, it's nice to see because we've covered this topic so many times and it's nice to be able to put it all into, into one place and see where you're going and see the vision for that because I think we've always had lots and lots of questions and I think I sat with Ms. Sarver through a long um, evaluation of the program a couple of years ago. So it's a, you've been addressing all of that, so thank you. So a uh, question, uh, I have four questions. Uh, one, uh, if we allow online, why don't we allow them to do it at home? So that's something that we are looking at. We've been updating some of our policies and things. Um, it depends. So what we've done with like that elementary early release day was, you can do that when you want to do it as long as it's done by November 17th and we didn't put a location on that. So maybe that needs to be more clearly communicated to our staff. That was elementary. What about mm -hmm. middle school and high school? So we haven't addressed their early release days yet. This has just launched this fall, so we'll be working on that throughout the course of the year. Well, I, I would encourage us, if, if the federal government can allow people to do training at home, it seems that APS should be able to pull it off. I've watched my husband cranking through lots of online training that he has to do, and they have a system for monitoring whether or not people are doing the training, so it seems that some of it should be done. Um, and then, what a, has the a, has AEA been consulted on any of this? Because we had a lot of questions from them last year about uh, this training. So we have been working with various groups. The last group that we met with was the Teachers Council on Instruction. As we start moving forward in doing this work with various other groups, we'll continue to engage other um, groups in the work. We have not gone directly to an AEA meeting and talked about this, um, but it's certainly something that we could do. I, I would welcome the opportunity and feedback from them to you, because I think it's yet another group that mm -hmm. likes to provide yeah. us with feedback and that we meet with regularly. Um, 
for as long as I've been involved with the school system, many of us with children, particularly with special needs, have this vision that at the beginning of the school year, our kids hit the classroom and the teachers and the aides have the training to meet the specific needs of our specific children. So in our perfect world, the teacher at the end of the school year gets the list of the class for the next year, looks at that roster, says, I need to brush up on my understanding of autism or my understanding of dyslexia or my understanding of ADHD or gifted students or twice exceptional students so they could maybe take some online brush ups over the summer or schedule a class or make sure that when they get to the Festival of the Minds that they're taking that. Um, that's something I know parents would very much like to have because a lot of time is spent at the beginning of the school year. Uh, finding out if the teacher really is tuned up to deal with your particular child. So uh, how, I guess that gets to, how do you make sure that the teachers are received? I know that they have options, but how do we know for sure that they're getting what they need to address the needs of the individual children in their classroom that year? So a lot of that has to do with the conversation around teachers as professionals, right? So looking at your class list and saying, oh, I have students who have these needs um, coming in and here are the different options that I have and I haven't had a lot of experience with dyslexia. I haven't had a lot of experience with twice exceptional students and that's where I'm going to spend my time over the next several weeks, whether that's during the summer or the August days or Festival of the Minds or whatever it might be. So that's what we're looking to our teachers to be able to say, I really need this um, in this moment. And then through the teacher evaluation process and classroom walkthroughs and things, seeing are the things that we would expect to be implemented for students being implemented. We, we used to have a, something in the business world called just-in-time learning, where you learned it exactly mm -hmm. as you needed yep. it. And the problem with our timing is that teachers don't get that class assignment till a few days mm -hmm. before school starts. So it's very hard to fit that training in. So I just, I'm pointing that out, that maybe we could back that up a little bit before Festival of the Minds so that if a teacher really needed X, Y, or Z, they could grab it before they get in and or have another opportunity later on at the beginning mm -hmm. of the school year. So I'm just advocating yep. for that because it's something that we've been, as parents, begging for for a long time because often we would find ourselves at cross purposes with teachers, not for anyone's ill intent, but rather we just found out that someone, our, our information was off. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons for looking at the different formats. So they don't have to wait until there's an early release day in October. There's an online module. Go ahead and do the online module and then collaborate. So, so we're if trying to do they could go home and do that, that, that would be <laughs> great. <laughs> okay, Mr. Goldstein? Yep. Thank you. Um, can you go back to slide five, please? Thanks. Um, so it would be, um, um, I'm looking at the disparity of the, um, the size of the bars here, which I'm sure relates to the number of people in each of those scale That's, definitions. Yep. So we've got, what, 3,500 teachers or something mm -hmm. like that, but only 35 or so principles or something. Right. So I think it would be more useful to um, display this information as uh, per person or you know something like that because 10,000, 100,000 hours? 100,000 hours yeah. versus five, 8,000 hours yeah. doesn't, you, sure. you know, for the, the P scale. It doesn't really tell me anything because I don't know how many people are involved there. Sure. So the um, so this is these are um, the number of hours participated in professional learning by each of, by staff in each of those scales total over the year, and we have in different years reported out on that data in the the average number of hours of a person in that in that scale over the years. There's some interesting. Um, 
background to take note of this, and this is why we have this great need for um, an integrated system of record for professional learning for all staff. So we started with this particular technology in 2003, and we pay a per person user fee in this system. And so we started with instructional staff with just te teachers in there, and it took many years for us to even deem that as a system of record. So there were lots of professional learning happening that weren't recorded in the system and folks distributing hand paper um, certificates and teachers tracking their own time for recertification and losing things. So there really was an involvement over time to say, to, just to even develop, like this is why this helps us, this helps our work, this helps us focus on the learning, not the paperwork. And so once we sort of solidified that better, you can see that in the jump between the first year 2000, after 2011, for the 11-12 school year, we deemed that the system of record for all teachers. So everyone had to put their professional learning in, in this system. Um, and then we said, well, we could use the system for other staff. It will help us as we deliver the one day a year to assistants. And then same with um, administrative conference for our P&E scale. This system can help us. So the different scales have been brought in um, further down the line in our implementation of the work. And so um, we really need the system that's integrated with our current Canvas system um, with HR. There's a lot of behind the scenes hand work that happens to, to keep the system going. And so we really are looking forward to, um, to doing that. For example, for the 652 people who participated in the online learning for the elementary county release, we then have to export that data and hand enter it into this system of records so they can have credit for it. So we're really looking for it. So, so this has its caveats to it. Um, okay, um, so you keep using this term system of records. So I, I mean, you're using it as a term of art. So can you tell me what it is? It's basically keeping track of the learning that teachers or other staff are engaged in because they need specific hours for licensure or to uh, Ms. Van Doren's point of if they're doing online learning, how are they capturing that? So if I go to a conference, I have to have a certain number of hours just like most other positions to keep my licensure. And so there's gotta be a way to keep track of my learning. And so if I go to a conference, I can put it into ERO. And then as an employee, I have one system of record that shows when I have to do my license renewal in five years, here's everything I've participated in in over the last five years and I can submit that and it allows us to see what are the kinds of topics that are most heavily um, used by our staff do we need to add additional sessions to something or is this something that would be better served online and so it allows us to track topics hours that kind of thing it's a tracking system yes and also provides the catalog for if I want to go to professional learning on this early release day here are all of the potential things that I have available to me on that day okay and, and you have a system of record right yes that was implemented in 11 or 12 or something or with even the, before that was what I heard dr. Sarber say dotted sure okay yep. but the action step to date on slide 8 it says you're going to release a request for a proposal for a system, another system of record, yes. another system of record. Yeah, we're looking to replace ERO as our system of record, or see if they have updates that we want to look at. That's the reason for their request for proposals. It hasn't been um, looked at in, I guess, over a decade, right? If we're had it since 2003, so we're looking to potentially update. You've had ERO since '03. Is that what you said? Yes, sir. What, what um, I don't understand the, um, what you were describing about the jump in the bar, the second bar in the. So, so a system takes a while to implement. So in 2003, it was the first year of the system. And so we spent time training staff on what it is and what it could do for us. And so use of the system was strictly voluntary. So offices could enter in their sessions as, um, as a part of the catalog 
if they wanted to. And so that implementation took a really long time. Um, and I wasn't in this office at the time. Um, there were lots of things around the reasons for it. Once, um, once 2010 came and we had the need for, we saw the potential of the system. Um, we said, this really needs to be the system of record for instructional staff. So if you're going to offer something, it needs to be in the catalog. And so that was the 2011-12 year. Okay. But now you feel that that system of record that started in 03 but then was enforced in 11-12 isn't doing the job anymore and that's why you want another one? We need to look at um, the integrations that are possible from onboarding to when new staff come to come to us in any scale. What skills do they come with? What knowledge do they come with? And what are avenues and pathways that we have for them to engage in their learning? So day one, we know what they come to us with and we have, oh, you need some help in this because you're gonna have a classroom of students who need this, here are the options for you. And that's connected to perhaps the evaluation system. So as a part of their evaluation, at that conference, they can say, well, I really need to go learn more about this and that, and through the evaluation system that they're automatically led to supports and modules that connect to that. So there are tremendous opportunities to the integration as well as career pathways to say, well, my goal is to become a principal. Let me see what kind of skills and knowledge I need to have and experiences I could have before I even become a part of that candidate pool. So I can start day one with all the skills and knowledge to, to do the job well. So we really see that there are some opportunities that new technologies could afford us. Okay. Um, so uh, if you go, uh, where is it? If you, oh yeah, if you go to slide 13. Can you see that? Oh, yeah. Yep. So I'm curious about the, um, the end point, you know, when we say we, we have achieved what we set out to achieve. So I think you just said that we got a system of record in 03, but it took seven, eight, nine years of either training or moving from a voluntary to a more mandatory system or something like that. So this says the expected completion is um, spring? Mm hmm So is that, in the spring, is everybody going to be trained? Is everybody going to be using it? Is everybody going to be, so, it, or is there a milestone farther out that really represents that we've achieved what we need to achieve by using it? So this particular milestone is that we've made a decision on what will the single system of record be. When that's completed in the spring, then we work with information systems to get that up and running. We help people with the transition from ERO into the new one or into a newer version of ERO, depending on what comes out of an RFP process. And so then we would work through the what are the next milestones and benchmarks based on whatever it is that we've selected, right? Once we know what we've selected and how similar or um, dissimilar it is to what we currently have, then we can start laying out the training plan. But because we already have a system in place, it would not take nearly as long to get something up and running. It's simply a new tool to do something that our other tool has done. But that would come once we know what that is. Once you know what the single system of record Correct. is that's been purchased, Correct. that's been yep. that w that's been acquired. Um, uh, are there metrics planned to show the progress towards getting done what we want to get done with this? I mean, not just acquiring it, not just the RFP and the, the identification and the acquisition by spring, but beyond that. For the single sign-on? For anything. Particular? So, yes. I mean, the goal would be that 100% of our staff are using whatever that tool is. That's the goal, right? It's the when goal, you talk but about what the, I'm asking is, how are you going to get there? Through a variety of steps that we will 
put out once we know what the single system of record is. So we'd have various benchmarks and milestones along the way to know are we hitting those benchmarks. And you don't, you can't identify yet what they, when they will occur, maybe not what they are, but when they will occur? Well, we would do training over the summer. I mean, we have a general idea, but until we know, are we continuing with the tool that we have or are we implementing a new tool, there's no way to actually put in, we're going to do this in June, this in July, and this in August, until we know for sure what it is we're going to be using to do that. I think, though, what we would do is once you determine the single sign-on, we would come back with those specific milestones, Mr. Goldstein, that you're asking It'll be for. In our plan. Uh, okay, so when could I expect to see that? Once we've made the decision on what the single the spring system is. 2018, mm -hmm. once the spring 2018 decision is made, then we'll have a, a more detailed or deeper plan about what the rollout would look like, the specifics of the rollout. Okay. Um, uh, all right. Um, yeah, see, I'm interested in finding out where that fits in the you know, the ultimate plan in getting to the goal. And then, of course, I, I assume we're going to have another session like this next year or work session or something like that, monitoring session. And at that time, use that program management plan to see how we're progressing and that we've checked off the stuff that we said that we're going to have accomplished by then or have an understanding of why it didn't happen because of there's a variety of reasons, you know, budget or state law changes or, you know, other fact of life realities or something, but then be able to do course correction because it's still something we want to get to and if fact of life realities get in the way, we don't want to just drop it. You know, we want to figure out how to adjust and, and keep moving forward towards the goal. So that's my interest in this, yeah. um, be able to get those milestones and periodically check in and see how we're doing on that path. I'm kind of confused. Um, what is, what is wait, our... Wait, 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 hang on, one at a time. Let's let Ms. Talanta go first. Thank you. Our, our goal is, my understanding is that our goal is to provide the best professional experience to our teachers that is flexible, supports them, and yep. ensures a quality instruction to our students. Um, all within, uh, within our budget constraints and um, you know, in, a, in a way that's efficient and transparent and, and helpful to the whole school system. So I know that we've been talking about this for a couple years. Is that the same goal you're discussing, Mr. Goldstein? Uh, yeah, I think so. On. Okay. I think so. That, I mean, these are, to me, interim steps in getting to something. And I think the something, the, you know, at the end of the road, something is, as you said, best professional learning for the staff that, that we can achieve. And we're doing that with a new single system of record and, I assume, a bunch of other things. And I guess the confusion I was having is, to me, this, there is no end point to this. This is a continuing growing process and as education reform comes online or new programs or we move to inclusion or whatever the next piece of our path is in the education system this project will continue to mold itself and shape itself and support our teachers in that process so maybe that was the disconnect that i'm having and and thank you for that clarification because now that this makes sense what you're you're asking is when are we going to have a streamlined process that we don't have to continue to improve on but it now works and grows with us yeah i, I think that's okay. I, I think that's the way i would put it okay uh, thank you I just clearly to... you're going to have to keep training Correct. and professional development all the time but uh, what I'm hearing is that there are, you know, software tools and other things that are going to um, enable our ability to do that. And when they're on board, when we've acquired them and when people are trained to use them, et cetera, um, then we will have that system right. working. And we may have to replace it in another 10 years. Right, right, which is why I'm interested in seeing what okay. the milestones are beyond this spring and this fall. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you all for you allowing us yes. to have that discussion. Thank you. Um, Mr. Lander, did you have a follow-up or did that get covered in that? Hopefully. 
Okay. All right, um, I, I'm gonna ask a, a couple of quick questions. By the way, um, since we were talking about that system, have we budgeted that already or is that something that's gonna come to us in the future for the expense since you, you're gonna pick it in the spring of 2018? I would look at it as a replacement, so it's already in the baseline budget because we have a current system to do that. I see, it's just so a new So we try new to stay within that it. same budget, yes. Okay, okay, great. Um, and uh, yeah, let me see again if I can attempt to summarize the process in terms of your reporting to us just to make sure everyone kind of, we all understand what we're going to monitor and, and watch and what's going to sort of happen without you telling us about it. Um, we did have that work session, it was a couple of years ago now, right, where we had a professional development that, where we were looking at your, the evaluation, so these recommendations mm -hmm. at that point. And I, I suspect, yes, were you there? Yeah, at SIFAX. I suspect that at that point you hadn't laid out that full matrix yet because you were really talking about the. Is this your first report to us since then? We tend to, I, I think we kind of look at topics at this, you know, here every two years. Yes, last year it was a briefing report. Right. So that's and so, available online. Yeah, and again, I just, I want to get a summarize so that, so that everyone mm -hmm. understands what we're sure. going to see. So next year again, unless we request otherwise, mm -hmm. um, we would get a briefing report from you, which mm -hmm. is kind of the next update of this. And you probably mm -hmm. will ha have purchased that system by then, and mm -hmm. you'll tell us some things, um, you know, and then a public meeting. Um, on top of that, do you have, is there a point where you do kind of report out from, you know, you had the evaluation, and um, is, is, is there anything specific you do in response to that evaluation or is it really just this monitoring it's this with, monitoring okay okay so you showed us what the recommendations were from that report mm -hmm. all of them you told us where you're headed mm -hmm. and then we're just going to kind of um, follow that over time and I guess as a board we need to decide if there's more detail we want that's something that that we can decide as a board it was it, the, this is great stuff and mm -hmm. you know we often talk about how you know, this This is what it's really all about, what mm -hmm. our teachers are doing in the classroom, and they need to have this this kind of, um, this skill development. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, but on, on another level, it was not listed as one of our priorities this year. So if we wanna, if we wanna dig more deeply into this, that's a little bit of a, of a, uh, a change from our path. Just, I just kinda wanted to um, remind everyone of that. Um, okay, so I, I did have uh, just, a couple of comments. First of all, I th this is also a big step forward from what mm. we saw before. I mean, this is a hugely organized now framework Very that, um, yes, I, I think it's really great. Mm -hmm. um, and I also had a couple questions, two quick questions uh, from the bar graph. Mm. And That's they are neat. simply, you were talking a lot about how people started using it, um, and you talked about that first bump, but there's also a bump um, last year with the last bar, 2015-2016. Um, was there more stuff going on then, or was, I mean, I know we had a few more teachers and such, but um, it looks like another day or something. I'll have to look at the data. Okay. I, um, I, I'm wondering if it had something to do with the um, support for um, staff around English language arts implementation. Mm -hmm. mm, okay. Because all of that was tracked in ERO, and that was many, many, many elementary teachers. And the only thing, and it's funny, it's, um, you know, we want professional development, but we also don't want teachers to be overloaded with too much other stuff on top of what they have to do every day. So it's, it's hard to know which way we really want to see things go. We, we like to see um, good stuff happening, but that, that makes a lot of sense also that it might just, just have been a one-time one -time thing with... It, isn't 15, charts. 16 the year when you, in order to get credit, you had to go into the system? I think that's just simply a... a a mandate that you all put in. I, that's my understanding. I'm, I have a lot of maybe, maybe a follow up. Sure. If if we can list that and just just get just so we know. Um, and then I was happy to hear you mentioned bus drivers. Mm -hmm. I don't think our bus drivers, cafeteria workers, front office folks are they in this graph or they're not. We started training other um, other offices that support other scales. Um, we did some training in information services, and when we realized our contract was up with this particular 
a um, vendor and that we had the opportunity to um, look at what's out there that that could happen we really put a hold on um, getting new staff into a system that perhaps we wouldn't be using in a year and so it was again more on a voluntary basis if people were facing challenges around tracking and organizing we welcomed them to use the system and we trained them um, but we didn't actively say everyone in all scales ever, all the offices should be using this because we knew that there might be something that would be a little different I, I should clarify I wasn't I, I, I whether they use the system or not is one thing, but okay. just whether they are getting professional oh, sure. development. You know, we talk about whole child thing. All right. adults who interact yes. with children should have learn about yes. working with children. And mm -hmm. so are we doing that? Do we have a plan to include those folks in professional development activities? Oh, absolutely. They're... Um, they are working on professional learning all the time in the different offices. So food services works on training their food services because they have regulations they have to follow. What our goal is through the framework is to then make it more systematic and aligned and so that we have um, as a part of the framework those skills and knowledge and modules for all of those different job types. Okay, great. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. You've been very patient with us. <laughs> we are going to go on to action items. Okay, um, and we have one action item tonight, and Mr. McAvice, thank you very much for your patience. Um, it is the 2018 internal audit work plan. Do you have any additional information for us before we go to our motion? There are no additional items. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Ms. Elliott, are there any speakers? Okay, um, we're ready to vote. Um, may I have a motion to approve the 2018 internal audit work plan? So moved. Is there a second? <clears throat> second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes five to zero. Thank you for your great work. We look forward to your report. You're welcome. Okay, um, all right, we're taking a little snack break up here, I think. As we get ready for our next information, we're going to move to information items. Uh, the first presentation is on the Ed Center Instructional Focus. Dr. Murphy. Yes, uh, let me turn back to Dr. Tara Natras, who's uh, got the Educational Instructional Focus update this evening. So, Dr. Natras, I'll yes. let you proceed. So we have been working through the Education Center instructional focus even before we knew that some of our 1,300 seats were going to be at the Education Center. And so we've been doing this work over the last several months and have had a team really working on this. You see um, Tyrone Bird, our Director of Secondary Education is here as he's been leading a lot of this process. And Lisa Stengel, through her work with planning, has also been um, a very key component to the work that we're doing. And so this evening, I'm actually going to take us back a little bit to how this process started and build into our recommendation for the instructional focus. So we've seen this slide already this evening. APS is working to create the best learning experiences for our students. And when we talk about instructional focus, we want to make sure that whatever we're putting into place ensures that this is happening. We also are experiencing strong enrollment growth. We have shifting demographics, as well as evolving state education requirements with the professional learning information. We referenced the profile of a graduate, as well as some of the other work that's taking place. And as you know, we are implementing complex and overlapping projects. Therefore, as we think about what we really want to have happen at the Education Center in terms of an instructional focus, we want to make certain that we are considering holistic opportunities and options for APS high school students. What I mean by that is, if I'm a student who is in elementary or middle school now, and we're thinking about what is it that we want to have for our students to be able to experience as they move through our system and they get into high school? So when we look at APS as a whole, if there are families who want a comprehensive high school experience, do we have that? If there are families who are interested in STEM, do we have that? If there are families interested in the arts or early college or whatever it might be, 
do we have those options and do those options have the evidence behind them that support the kinds of learning experiences that we want for our students? And so we also, in doing that work, need to take into account the other projects that are being reviewed. So as we've been talking about the Education Center, we also know that we have the Career Center being discussed um, in the background. We're also talking about boundaries as well as all of the other projects that were in the superintendent's update tonight. And so thinking about where does the Education Center instructional focus fit into that because of all of the complexity of the overlapping work. And then finally, thinking about the instructional focus that addresses the core criteria that was developed by the internal team that was looking at the instructional areas of focus for the Ed Center. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that criteria later in the presentation. Thus far, we have done a lot of work in this area that started more formally um, last January with a report from the Advisory Council on Instruction on potential options for whatever location we were to select for the 1,300 seats. We also last year did a community questionnaire, and I'm going to go over those results. We had a board motion in June, a work session in August, and then had several meetings with APS staff, students, and ACI chairs to really look at the work of the Education Center and do an analysis. We had a community engagement session on October 18th and have had a community questionnaire that actually closed yesterday to gather additional feedback and input from the community in addition to what was done last February and March. When we look at holistically what our community has said could be potential options for this location or any other location for those 1,300 seats, there were 16 potential options laid out by ACI, the Advisory Council on Instruction, to include everything from a ninth grade academy to a creative and performing arts school to an additional H.B. Woodlawn program, looking at an online high school, all of the things that you see here. So we started with this idea of here are 16 potential options that we could consider. Then we did a community questionnaire to really reach out to our families and say, what is of most interest to you when we talk about the building of new schools? And so you can see the question that was asked back in February and March of last year. In planning for new schools, one option um, that we are exploring is to create additional options for families that focus on instructional programs. If that happens, how interested would you be in these options? You can see the results. We had about 2,300 responses. We were shy two people to hit that benchmark. Um, but you can see the interest in STEAM, STEM, and project-based learning is all around 80%. So am I interested or very interested in any one of those three hit about 80%? The fourth one is international baccalaureate. Sorry, you can't read the baccalaureate part on here, but um, that one is right around 70%. And then creative and performing arts is right around the 50% mark. Everything else was less than that um, when you go back to those options that we just looked at. So what we can surmise from this is our community really has a strong interest in science-based programs where students are doing hands-on learning and project-based learning like we saw with the robotics um, this evening as well as international baccalaureate. The great thing about that is we have that, right? So if you want STEM, you can go to Arlington Tech and access that. If you want international baccalaureate, you can come to Washington Lee and access that. So in June, the board passed a motion to look at what then will several elements of the high school seats include. So we had 1,300 seats, and we said that five to 600 would go at the Ed Center, six or seven to 800 would go to the Career Center. Within that motion, one of the elements of that was that we would come forward with additional recommendations no later than December of 2017. And those recommendations include everything from a program and instructional focus to things like parking requirements, physical education programs and field space, and then thinking about funding requirements and things through this particular motion. From that, we took an analysis of the options. We had the work session in August where we talked about here's the way we believe that work might look. And then we started analyzing the 16 options that we had. 
were reduced to 10 based on some of that feedback from February and March, as well as some overlap. So the feedback in February and March, maybe 4% of people were interested in an online high school or very interested. So we didn't analyze that because it also doesn't help with seats, right? So we got from 16 to 10 by looking at factors like that. Then with those 10, we analyzed them based on these criteria, and we shared these criteria um, a couple of weeks ago in the superintendent's update. We were looking at things like, does the particular program that's being presented complement our current programs or fill a needed gap? We want to be really mindful of whatever it is that we choose that it doesn't compete with a program we already have if there isn't the interest to then fill both locations, right? If we knew this is what everyone is most interested in and we could fill those, great, but we have to make sure that all of the seats are filled with whatever we choose. Alignment with workforce demands, Virginia profile of a graduate, the level of innovations. So you can see all of the things that we looked at, and then you can see their weightings. And so alignment with workforce demands, profile of a graduate, and program access and equity were the things that the team felt were most important. Then demand, obviously, is incredibly important. And then long-term viability. Whatever we put at the education center, will it um, be viable throughout, you know, the next decade or however long we want to define long term. These are the results of that. So we analyzed all 10 of the programs with those criteria and then from that analysis narrowed to four. And the four that we narrowed to were an expansion of Washington Lee that could also include an expansion of the IB seats because we know there's an interest in IB. We also um, narrowed to creative and performing arts to a STEAM option as well as to an early college option. You can see as you look at this that the great thing about all four um, potential options is that most of them meet criteria in all of the areas. So we really can't make a poor choice. There are things, great things about each one of these options as we're moving forward with this work. We also looked at things like logistics. We didn't wait these because they're going to happen regardless of whether we expand Washington Lee or we put a kind of standalone program. So when you look at creative and performing arts, you look at STEAM and you look at early college, those are each standalone programs that wouldn't necessarily be connected to Washington Lee unless we wanted to do specific activities and things with both. But the expansion of Washington Lee, it is a direct connection. It's additional seats there. So we looked at things like the facility, transportation, as well as program specific costs. And with facility, you see that regardless of the option that is selected, we'd be looking at 24 learning spaces. Then we would have a dining commons, a physical education or multi-purpose space, um, because whether we expand Washington Lee or we were to have a self-contained program of some kind here, we need to have additional space simply because there are additional students. And then you see for the standalone programs, an administrative suite would be necessary in those, but not necessarily for Washington Lee because, again, it's the expansion. For creative and performing arts, we would need a performance space. For STEAM, we would need a specialized lab space. Things like transportation, regardless, there would be an added cost. But our hope is, if it were a standalone program, we already have IB buses that are going all over the county, and so students could easily ride that bus, right, to get to whatever the program is. And then program-specific costs, looking at things like IB training, our teachers need IB training for the IB program, or costs to equip a performance space or specialized labs are also considerations. What is not on this slide but is on the Engage page are all of the other costs, looking at personnel, looking at everything else. It just simply doesn't fit um, on a slide like this. We also, as I said, had a community questionnaire that went out after the community engagement on October 18th, came back to us on November 1st. I'm going to read you those results because when this went into board docs, we didn't have them because it closed yesterday. So we ended up with 457 responses to that particular questionnaire. 51% of the respondents have elementary students in APS. 36% have middle school students and 29% have high school students. 
And of course, you can check more than one so those numbers don't add up to 100, because I could have a middle schooler and an elementary student um, as well. What we asked with that particular one, we narrowed it to the four options and we said, if APS were to implement an early college program, how interested would you be in that program on a scale of one to four? And then people could provide comments. So that interested and very interested, when we looked at the arts, was 36%. 36% for early college as well. STEAM was 55%, so a little bit lower than the last survey. Um, and then the Washington Lee expansion with IB was 63%. So thinking about demand is really important when we're considering putting an additional program in a space that we know has to be filled. And so what we have learned from this process from January all the way until I'm standing in front of you tonight is that as we consider the input from the community and we think about the similarities and differences within these particular programs, there were strengths in all of them. All four of them could be really feasible options. Um, we want to really go back to considering holistic opportunities and options for our students. We are going to make a recommendation this evening that we really focus on the second bullet where we're taking into account the other projects being reviewed. What we want to make sure of is that we don't come to you this evening with a recommendation and say, we really think that based on everything we've looked at, there should be a STEAM-based program here at the Education Center. Then we start going through the process for the Career Center and we say, ooh, well we've got Arlington Tech there and we're going to expand it and is there potential for another high school there? We're going to do the charge in a few minutes. Um, and then we step back and go, well, but we already said we're going to do this at the Ed Center and now we can't do this at the Career Center because we've, and then we're going back and forth. So our recommendation this evening is really to say with the Education Center site, that we move forward with the BLPC process. What you saw in those logistics with the facilities was we're going to have 24 learning spaces no matter what. That's not going to change based on the instructional program. And Mr. Chadwick's team is amazing when saying, here are the kinds of adaptable spaces that we can provide for various um, locations and things. So if we decided that the common spaces needed to turn into a lab for something for a STEM program, that could be built into that. So our recommendation is that we move forward with the BLPC process and that we really work on a couple of different things when we talk about the instructional focus. One is that we work through the strategic planning process to be able to say, what do we want as a community? Like, do we want all of our schools to be neighborhood schools? Because if we do, it makes it really easy to decide what it is we want at the Ed Center or um, at the Career Center, or any other new school that we're building. Or do we say through that process that we believe our students should have various options and then what do those options look like K-12 across the board? So that if I'm interested in STEM, do I have a K-12 progression all the way through? If I'm interested in immersion, are there ways for me to access that both in elementary, middle, and high school? And so thinking about what's happening at the Education Center and the Career Center together with all of the other projects we're doing is the recommendation that we're bringing forward to you. So we are not saying we believe that it should be this one program. What we're really saying is we want to look at it with several of the other projects and then come back with a, here's what we're looking at for all of our high schools, not one particular location. So that is the motion um, that we looked at last June and I wanted to just walk us through each of those elements and what that then means. So the program and instructional focus was one of the things that we were asked to bring a recommendation forward with, and that recommendation would follow with all of those other pieces. The high school boundary revisions, we would recommend we don't look at until the fall of 2018, if they're needed, based on what it is we decide to do. And then each of those other components actually live in the BLPC process. So if we go ahead and move forward with the BLPC process, we can go deeper into this information while also working through the strategic plan and the Career Center instructional focus to say, here's what we want holistically for all of our high schools. Um, so the next steps that we would propose would be to launch the building level planning committee for the Education Center site and then continue to work through the strategic planning process through June. So 
That's it. I will take any questions. Thank that you. you may have. Uh, first, uh, Ms. Elliott, do we have speakers? We have one speaker, Stacy Snyder. Hi. Uh, good evening, members of the school board and uh, Dr. Murphy. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to speak this evening on behalf of the Facilities Advisory Committee. Uh, we would like to offer the school board some considerations from a facilities perspective that we feel are important to factor into your, your decision regarding the instructional focus of this renovated Ed Center. Understanding that a large part of the input and considerations for the final decision on this renovation will fall under instruction, we believe that there is also an important facilities piece that should be considered. We are not making a recommendation or prioritizing these considerations because we have not had an opportunity as a group to review the various options in detail. Instead, we hope to point out um, some questions and considerations so that there is a broader range of information from which you can pull as you make your final decision. The FAC consistently advocates for making the most efficient use of space, ensuring that we are addressing our seat needs on time and on budget, and creating spaces that are flexible and adaptable for future uses. Based on 2016-17 projections, in 2021, we will have a deficit of 618 seats at the high school level in 2021. Oh wait, I already said that. When we are projected to grow, uh, and then we are projected to grow approximately 300 seats at the high school level per year until 2024. Because of our demands on our seat need due to this growth um, d during this time period, please consider the number of seats created within each options and whether any of these options are easier or more amenable to completing before 2022. Consider that spending the same amount of money on 500 versus 600 seats would raise the cost per seat and would necessitate building additional seats at a different location. It is important when making facilities decisions to ensure that we are making the most efficient use of our sites and the spaces we are creating. Which common spaces are built into this renovation is, is important to consider because there could be trade-offs for space and the number of seats created. This decision must also be seen in the context of this building sharing a site with Washington and Lee, a neighborhood comprehensive high school. And it is important to understand that the impacts of this decision will have on spaces, um, will have on shared spaces on this site. What are the impacts on parking or field space? What are the common spaces that would be required for each options and what are their space requirements? Would some of the common spaces needed for an instructional option require additional or larger spaces that would result in fewer seats being created? What would the impacts on shared common spaces such as fields and possibly other common spaces such as gym or an auditorium or extracurricular opportunities for all students be? Building spaces that are flexible and adaptable to future needs is an important consideration within our growing school system. Are there options which create a greater possibility for adaptability? We suggest avoiding created spe creating specialized spaces that would make it harder to adapt. We have concerns, we also have concern that specialized facilities will result in fewer seats, resulting in higher costs and less flexibility. Are there options that would lead to lower transportation costs moving forward? The FAC is a group that represents the facility interests of all of Arlington, and we recommend that APS approaches this decision by taking a broad view of how it impacts seat needs, both when the building is complete, in the years following, and how that fits into our vision of maintaining our top quality educational system as we grow. We support the recommendation to align this decision with the Career Center and with the K-12 vision being created with the Strategic Planning Committee. We do have some questions on how the BLPC can proceed with evaluating common space needs without a decision being made on the instructional focus. While we support adaptable spaces, we feel it's important to consider how to best utilize the space within the larger context of how it fits on the site and how it impacts the entire APS system. Thank you. Thank you. And board colleagues, questions, comments? Uh, yeah, a quick Scroll comment. Tonight. Yeah. Um, I, if you could send us those uh, remarks so I could go over them a little bit more detail slowly, I'd really appreciate that. Thank you. Would you like to begin with 
Any questions or comments? Thank you. <clears throat> um, I'm confused about how this would fit into the strategic planning process. Is the, uh, is the idea to say to the strategic planning committee, you must put this in as a goal? Uh, uh, what's your vision for this? Part of the charge for the strategic planning committee is around the K-12 instructional focus. And so my vision for this is the thinking about what do we want as a community when we think about various options for our students. The strategic planning committee may come out with a vision or mission or core values or even goals that say we really want to have X type of school, whether it's neighborhood schools or what are most important to us, or we want our students to have options as they move through um, our schools. And so part of that that will come out through both mission and vision work around kind of big picture vision, but also then with our goals, if we look at that ensuring every student is challenged and engaged as one of our current goals, a strategy underneath that might be to have options schools within our k-12 spectrum for any family who's interested in it right and then we would have specific action steps under that to achieve it so what we'd be looking for with the strategic planning committee has to do with both mission and vision and then are there any specific strategies that speak to instructional programs as we continue to grow as a system that may come out in a strategy or even a um, goal potentially are you talking the about the, the taxonomy <clears throat> the taxonomy structure but suppose they don't come up with a goal that says K-12 instructional alignment or something like this. Uh, that's the part that's confusing me. How are we going to be assured that our needs for this decision process get played out in the strategic plan, uh, well, the ultimate plan? The work of the Strategic Planning Committee is to develop that taxonomy of mission, vision, core values, goals, strategies, and objectives. What will come out of that? It could be a formal strategy. It could be something that's in our mission and vision or core value statements that we can point to and come back to when we're looking at that. Or it could be something that comes out of conversation from four meetings where we say, okay, this may not fit a strategy, but as we're moving forward, this is what we need to be thinking about and considering because the strategic plan is pointing us to where are we going in the next six years? I can't imagine writing a strategic plan where we don't include something around what is our K-12 instructional vision over those six years. It's going to have to live there someplace because instruction is a very large piece of what we do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you say that now, but the strategic planning committee may not agree with you. Yeah, uh, you know, we have charge. It's in the it's charge. It's part of we the charge. charge that we the ask board them provided. to include that in, in the strategic plan. Uh, okay. We do a million things, and, but the strategic plan is going to reflect five or three or seven high-level goals. And <clears throat> even though they're talking about the instructional alignment, it, it may not end up as one of those goals. This is the part yeah, that's confusing me. It could end up as a me. strategy to achieve the goal. So can we... I cannot imagine there won't be a goal in there about something to do with student learning. So one of the strategies to get to the levels of student learning that we want is going to have to focus on what does that mean in terms of the instructional approach in all of our schools and the vision for that. Um, so I just can't imagine that it wouldn't live there someplace. All right. Um, more. I guess there's going to be more to come on that. Um, my other one point here, I guess, is for a discussion with my colleagues. Reading that motion from June 29th, I don't see how we can move forward with this recommendation without amending that motion because that motion says that the superintendent will bring us recommendations on a variety of things, one through eight, but at the very bottom it says we won't be constituting a BLPC until he does. And this recommendation flip-flops that. Mr. Goldstein, that's why I, and when I get to my comments, I'm suggesting we provide some direction to clarify our next steps when we meet next time. And when you're done with your questions, I'll make some comments to that. 
And I have comments as well. Yeah, I'm done with my okay. questions. Guys, I just... let's, let's wait till we're recognized by the chair. Mr. Goldstein, would you finish, please? Thank you. I, I'm done with the questions. I just want to have a discussion about how we're going to do this. I fully agree that we need to not rush into a decision on an instructional focus right this moment and, and take the time to do it. But, you know, we also have something on record that we voted on that doesn't align with that right now. Could I ask for just a clarification quickly with the slide about, because um, I think you tried to respond to that with this mm -hmm. slide about how the different pieces are being addressed. And your point is that most of those pieces, I mean, you're, you're right um, that a number of, of elements in the motion don't happen yet because we actually, I think, I think you're saying they're part of the BLPC yeah. process. Mm -hmm. So they wouldn't, I mean, in a sense, we're going to charge the BLPC and we will tell them to do those things, but we wouldn't mm -hmm. decide them before the BLPC because they're actually BLPC right. items. Is that? Mm -hmm. Yes. So that final sentence in the motion is what we would have to look at. That BLPC process will commence, will not commence before the school board has received and acted upon the recommendations. We'll have to. Yes, sir. And, yes, and I'm sir. not against amending the motion. I just don't want to be in a situation where we are really violating what's already been, you know, voted on. And yeah. Excellent point. We'll, we'll continue that discussion. Um, let, let's go to Ms. Van Doren. Did, sure. Did, I'm sorry. Yeah, I come from okay. Okay. I was, Thank you. I was going you. in the order that people were okay. jumping in. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, the first thing I want to say is thank you. Because as we go through this year, we have 14 different processes that we're undertaking. And I think that this, we are going at light speed in comparison to what Arlington normally does. We process things thoroughly in Arlington to the point where by the time we make a big decision, everybody thinks you made it last year and we all agree on it or try to. Um, so thank you because we have to move fast. Our community wants us to move quickly. We're not used to doing it. And what that requires then is course corrections from time to time. And I just really want to say thank you because I think it shows a, a sign of a very healthy organization that can stop in the middle at the end of a process and go, you know what, we have to make a significant course correction here. We have to stop for a minute and rethink this because I think you've come to exactly the right place. It makes sense to do the strategic plan first and then see where these great opportunities at the secondary level here and at the Career Center and potentially when we're done with the CIP somewhere else, mm -hmm. how those fit together into this overall plan that we have for Arlington and that our community is asking us to address. So I can't thank you enough for being bold enough to stop for a minute and say that. I watched you present this last night at ACI mm -hmm. and preview that. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because what I what is expecting to have happen and I feared was going to happen in the community was because we went at the speed we did, it was and had as not that much opportunity to, to dialogue about it, people were confused. So what happened in ACI was like a microcosm of what I thought was going to happen in the community. And, and people started to ask a lot of questions of you. And they were chewing things apart and saying, well, what does this mean? And what does that mean? And how is that going to work? But then when you explained that first you wanted to do the strategic plan and then fill in this piece, there was sort of a relief. I'm like, oh, that makes sense. So I just, my biggest thing is to say thank you for, for having the wisdom as a staff to say to us, that was a nice notion that was good at the time, but now let's do a course correction. So really, really, really appreciate that. Um, my mantra going forward is going to be, as the strategic plan comes forward, that our community is looking for consistency across all the schools. They want to know that whatever school they're in, they consistently get a high quality education. They want equity of access. They may not be able to be assured to get into every program, but they want to feel like they have a shot at it, as we heard from the young women who spoke this evening. And as we keep hearing from the county, we're going to have to make these sustainable. We're going to have to make them affordable. So 
for me, again, we're also looking at that, and that was in the charge. We did mm -hmm. have those elements. But here we are at a course correction. And uh, just a couple of comments, I think, as we go forward, a little opportunity to really clarify those options with a little bit more detail and a little more facts, because I think there was a lot of confusion about what they meant. I heard a lot of different descriptions of what the IB meant and what early college meant and STEM. We heard last night that some people didn't understand where Arlington Tech was still. Mm -hmm. So that was really interesting. That's how fast we're going, is that we're still catching people up. So I think it's great that we're going to have an opportunity, and I would encourage staff to take this extra time that I hope you're going to have to really put some meat on the bones of the bullet points that are those mm -hmm. concepts to really give us some detail and give the community something to read. Because I got a lot of inquiries as people were going through that survey. Mm -hmm. I want more information on this and this and this, and they didn't have any more, and they really wanted it. So I think that'll be a great mm -hmm. opportunity to provide that, because maybe it won't be here, or maybe it might be somewhere else. So let's start to flesh that out, because the community came forward and asked for that. So I just wanted to um, provide that with as thought, and also, one thing I've learned about Arlington is that we own our schools. You know, we love our schools. We really love our schools, and we love our programs. So we really do have to be deliberate here and at the Career Center and at the next secondary set of seats that we pick something that we love as much as we love what we currently have because we're going to own it. <laughs> People own this stuff, so we have to be careful. And we also are going to have constrained resources. We don't have new, lots of new land. We're, we're going to have to make those decisions and very mindfully, very thoughtfully. So with that said, um, I am going to suggest to my colleagues that we provide direction that corrects, uh, helps us, the board, give my, my inclination would be to give exactly what I'm thinking you're asking for, which is to have the BLPC go first. Mm -hmm. But provide some, we'll hopefully get a charge and put that together and do that first and focus on the amount of money we want to spend here, the time frame and the adaptability issues and put that in the charge and then give you that time to look at the focus, but then look at that focus within the confines of what that building will be mm -hmm. coming forward, which I think will help sort through some of those decisions. So, that, so that's where my brain is. I'm hoping to draft something for my colleagues to look at uh, that would be a direction that would give you the pieces there with that would amend and I don't think we have to amend the motion I think we can just supersede the motion so um, I think that that's possible um, and that's that's what I would suggest and I just want to say thank you for the thoughtfulness and and um, it's a good dialogue for the community. The one thing I think we're missing is a little dialogue back and forth on these options for clarity's sake between the community and, and staff so that the staff understands what the community thinks it wants and the community understands what the staff thinks it's, mm -hmm. it's considering and that together with the strategic planning group. So I have just encourage that to, to not think, okay, we're going to put that off for a year, but rather it somehow be a continuing dialogue so that we hone our understanding of what we're looking at. So that's my, I'm going to offer that to my colleagues. I think that would be a good way to clarify this when we come back on the 14th. Mr. Lento. Um, and I just want to take a moment to apologize to my board chair for, well, no, it's, you know, when you get on the school board, there are processes and, pol and, and steps that we follow to keep an orderly process moving forward. I'm new and I'm passionate, if you haven't noticed that. And so sometimes I'm anxious to get, have the conversation and have the dialogue. Um, but I think that it's important to respect the process because there'll be times where we are very passionate and it would not be wise to speak out of turn to give everyone a voice at the dais and ensure that we are presenting to our community where we stand and why we stand and what we heard from our community. So I just want to acknowledge that and I, I do apologize for that. Um, I didn't want to follow up on the conversation that you and Mr. Goldstein were having about the strategic planning committee and the mm -hmm. center focus. So I want to make sure that one of the things that I'm always concerned about is that we're always on the same page. And this is what I understand, and I would like clarification to make sure, sure. that this is the vision. The strategic plan will be providing us a new mission, vision, or reaffirming our new mission, vision, and goals, either or, or a combination of both, as well as the taxonomy of how we're going to put that forward in our system over the next six years. We, the, when we move forward with all of the actions, we ensure that they 
um, complement our strategic plan, that mm -hmm. our strategic plan is being addressed in those motions that we make. And so the reason that we're asking, one of the reasons that we're asking to put this on hold and really focus on building adaptable uh, space for our high school seats is so that once we have a new strategic plan, we can align our educational focus with that strategic plan. Exactly. Okay, perfect. And so then I want to make clear to the community that the educational focus is in a policy for school board. We will not, the strategic plan will not decide an educational focus. Right. Once that strategic plan is approved and moved forward, then we will ensue a process again, and I don't know what that process is, and maybe we provide some direction to that in uh, something of the, what Ms. Van Doren suggested. Um, I did note the last line that Mr. Reed mentioned in our motion, which I had not paid attention before, so perhaps we can supersede that, but I do think there has to be something that shows why we moved course, and perhaps we can figure out how that educational focus will be decided or uh, discussed in the future or we even say we'll use the information already in hand and the process that was provided beforehand but whatever it is I wanted to ensure the community that this is just a uh, just a hold for now but there is an actual school board process we will take a vote on an educational focus once the strategic plan has been decided on and I want to confirm that that's my understanding with my colleagues because again I am learning uh, a little bit as I go mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, great, wonderful. And that's all the comments. And thank you for the work, um, and thank you for the community and, and stepping up and providing responses in the short time frame that we had. Uh, I really appreciate the um, effort that's been put into this. Thank you. Mr. Lander. Uh, I want to thank Ms. Snyder for coming out this evening. Uh, I'm the liaison, the liaison to the um, Facilities Advisory Committee, and so there was a uh, discussion or, or input from <laughs> Uh, a number of members online and uh, uh, I'm going to s stick to the facility side and stay away from the instructional focus side and so uh, this board previously um, provided guidance with regard to facilities that are construction moving forward should not be dependent upon instructional focus which is something that Ms. Snyder brought up and so I think it's important to continue to separate the two because no matter what construction happens to this facility the instructional focus should be able to fit here they should be uh, independent of each other and the reason why that's important is because I think you can have two processes move in parallel the other thing that's going to be important to consider as a board is are you going to maximize space utilization or uh, seat acquisition because those two things will be in conflict and so before you give direction if at some point we decide to accelerate the timeline of the BLPC we will have to determine as a board do we want to maximize space utilization or do we want to gain as many seats as possible and given the seat deficit that Ms. Snyder referenced the FAC uh, statement doesn't make a recommendation but you're not able to have both so when you talk about 500 or 600 seats there are trade-offs and so I think the direction I believe that the direction this board will need to give to the BLTPC will require a consensus prior to that so that um, the BLPC will be able to focus on the task at hand as opposed to um, an unlimited amount of trade-offs on how this building could be constructed to um, gain 25 seats or, or um, uh, additional square footage in a multi-purpose room. Those type of things I don't think from given the time schedule that we're working with is the best use of the time and so I bring that to your attention now because if the timeline for the BLPC gets adjusted the priorities on what direction we give to the BLPC is a decision that will require, be required from the consensus of the board. So that was the piece that I wanted to get from the FAC. Okay, um, it sounds like people like the recommendation. We really haven't heard any pushback on your actual recommendation. Mm -hmm. Now we're just dealing with 
the logistics, the process, the logistics, technicalities. <laughs> yep. And um, so I think we'll have some conversations about that, mm-hmm. whether there are steps that need to take. Um, we certainly want staff input mm-hmm. on any, w- what we might have okay. to do. So we'll, I know we'll have, um, we'll do some dialoguing about this and, mm-hmm. and figure out if, what we might need to do. But it, it, okay. it sounds like we have a plan. Mm-hmm. Just Great. working out those details. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. One final information item. Um, the, career, the charge to the Career Center Working Group. Dr. Murphy. Yes. I see Lisa Stingle making her way. And Ms. Um, Stingle, I'm going to try and go through sort of a course of events that's led us here this evening uh, to bring <laughs> forward the charge uh, with, with just a little bit of background. And I'll just ask if uh, there's something that I neglected to fill in that you uh, elaborate a little bit more on that. Um, as we've been moving forward with the, the career center working or, or the career center plan as it relates to the current CIP and the future CIP, we began to engage in a collaboration with the county on this. Coupled with that, the uh, Joint Facility Advisory Committee and our um, Facility Advisory Committee uh, began to also address this or look at this as what I'll call a sounding board or to provide some input about how we may move forward with this, which has really resulted in this charge being brought forward this evening which is also something that the county board is going to be discussing at one of their upcoming um, meetings. I will say we are in process with this. In other words, this is an information item this evening. So we do have some time for this board as well as the county board to go back and make some adjustments. And so within that context, I'll turn to Ms. Stingle to do a very brief presentation of the charge and also elaborate on anything maybe that I neglected to uh, uh, give as background that's gotten us here this evening. You did great. Actually, and it's also nice coming after Dr. Natras where we talked about the instructional piece because that plays in here also. So when we did, when you did adopt the career center or the 1300 high school seats, this was the complement. This is where those additional seats are gonna go. Um, so Dr. Murphy gave the background. I'm gonna walk you through what's in the charge. And it starts with, again, that adoption of 7,800 plus high school seats at the career center by 2022. We need those seats. Um, so that's part of the, um, what's in the CIP and what we've committed to. But as we've looked at this and we looked at the opportunity at the Career Center site, your charge actually recognizes that, you know, the, the pressures on the community to provide um, these opportunities to, to lo- use our land more um, strategically to get more out of it. And um, you've entered this joint work with the county board to develop a plan that now has us both working together to plan for the site. Um, But also, at the bottom, what you'll note is APS will lead a separate process to address the instructional focus. What we just heard about on the strategic plan, that will take care of that piece of it. So this group will look at how we plan for that site and make the best use of the available space. So the the charge, which is posted on board docs, um, defines how APS can open those 7,800 seats at the Career Center facility by 2022. We have to have those online in that timeline within the funding approved by the school board and providing options for optimizing future development of public facilities within the study area through a phase development. So what I've done here is pulled out a timeline. Some of this is in there, but I wanted to actually add some additional pieces that I think are helpful. So the Career Center Working Group will look will work on that phased um, development site plan. They, their work will begin in December and it will end in May. Then next fall, the BLPC and the PFRC, the Building Level Planning Committee and the Public Facilities Review Committee, will be working on that, uh, making sure that we have those 7 to 800 seats are online. So they'll be planning for the site, for the actual school portion of it. Um, there's the use permit approval and the construction. So the school will proceed. Now some of the other stuff that comes out of the site, um, the phase site development plan may take a lot, much longer period of time, but by working together, it begins to go into each, um, the county and the school board CIPs. So there's some key parameters for APS in this. And what I pulled out tonight to share is really the APS side of the stuff. The county has a lot of pieces in there that they're worried about. I didn't bring those forward. You can read them. Um, There's another group looking at those closely, I'm sure. But what we have in there is that 
we'll retain all existing APS programs through 2022 at the site already. So the Career Center programs and the planned expansion of Arlington Tech, the Montessori program, which will be located in the Patrick Henry building, and then Arlington Community High School. We're not saying anything's going to happen to those after that either. We're just saying that at least through this time frame, those are in there. There's other elements in the charge. We have site-specific goals for 2022, which include getting those seats online, and then other goals beyond that that actually include, again, building out the site and putting in other things that the community may be looking for. There are facility-specific goals. There are capacity phasing goals. Um, transportation and parking, there's some interesting stuff in there. As the county, one of the, one of the reasons why this site was such a good site among the ones that we looked at for the 1,300 seats is because of the infrastructure of transportation already there. But we also want to make sure that our students and staff have what they need to actually get back and forth. Um, there's an element of further study. So as that group, if they can't make all of the recommendations or they find there's some additional things to, to do beyond what they're able to do in their time frame, there's a place for them to provide direction for further study about the site. The um, charge lists the membership, and you'll see all the groups that are defined there, and it's a balance of both community organizations and school-related um, people that feed into those um, groups. We're actually sending out information tomorrow from both the county and APS to begin working with those community groups to identify representatives. Um, and it also talks about resources and staffing, both from the county and schools. That's it. Excellent. Thank you very much. Ms. Elliott, do we have any speakers? Okay. Board colleagues, questions or comments? Mr. Goldstein. Um, thank you for the presentation. Can you go back to slide five, please? I can't see the numbers. I'm sorry. So, yeah, that's, that's fine. Okay. Um, so I, I think um, there's a lot of stuff that's going to have to be done or worked out through the leadership of the, the, the working group to make sure that, you know, things aren't, kind of going off track and where this kind of where I picked up my ears here was about um, retention through 2022 and are we talking about at the site or the program within APS at all okay okay This evening. Did you? Yep. Okay. Um, you're, not, you're not paying attention. I'll to take me. your word for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. Okay. But that um, there's no. Is there a chance that we're going to be changing those programs after 2022? And I think that's something that we would have to evaluate based on where we are at that point in time but they will at least be on that site uh, until 2022. Correct. Okay. Um, as I said, I think this is something that leadership of the, the working group would, you know, kind of keep people within the lines and, you know, not let them get outside of the lines if that discussion gets to that, I, to that point. You know, I, I think on a personal level, I think people are looking for stability and program. They also are planning for their future and they want to know that these programs have um, a longevity to them. And so I think it's important that we communicate that if we expect them to grow and if we expect them to flourish. So that's the uh, idea behind it or that's the intent behind it. Um, and, um, you know, as you saw with Dr. Natras's information about STEAM and STEM, um, you know, the Arlington Tech program actually should continue to accelerate at a very nice rate. Okay, anyone else? Mr. Lento. Um, I'd just like to follow up on Mr. Goldstein's comment. Uh, I'm a big advocate for the Career Center programs in the site, and I think that the site offers very unique opportunities to the cohort of students that um, the Career Center in Orange Community High School serves. And I think that Montessori moving into the Patrick Henry building 
uh, is important for them to be established as an individual program versus a program being shared at an elementary school. Um, as since that is the way that we are moving, since that's the direction we're moving in. And so uh, I just want to also think about if these programs in the long run, if anything is considered for moving, there is a five year window for any of those principles or programs to understand what that move is, figure out where they could go, see how they could improve, prepare their community, so for me, that five years is a big deal because our working group is not gonna go for five years. It's gonna go for six months. So if they're looking at a very long-term vision for moving anything, which right now at this time, I personally do not, would not support, uh, but that's okay because it's not, it's not my position or my purview. Um, it's really the community that has to decide that and all the people involved. And one of the things that I strive for is to be objective, but I just, want to help people to understand change is difficult and when we are moving programs and creating that type of instability for anything when you move into a new house it's an unstable time having time to prepare and understand where you could go and take your community because here in Arlington every school is its own community uh, every school that I have experienced is its own community and they hold each other together like glue through thick and thin. Um, so I just want to reemphasize that point uh, that I'm not, I'm grateful that we have that stability through 2022. And I hope that uh, the working group is able to see the gems that we have on that site so that we can really incorporate it into whatever amazing vision uh, comes forth through that. Thank you. Um, Ms. Van Dorn. I just want to comment that I think uh, as we plan for all the change that we're going through, we're, we're getting, there's a lot of movement that happens behind the scenes to get the wording right in these things and to really be very deliberate about the charges that we have. And I think they're really, really important because uh, having been a member of many of these groups, you're always going back to that charge to make sure you're doing the job you've been appointed to do. And it's important, that, and I think we're really deliberately taking the time, and I know the county board is, we did that with the community facilities study. We're now doing it in providing a charge to each of the BLPCs that we do, and I, I really appreciate that, and I think we're getting good at that on the facility side. I just wanna advocate that we begin to think as we approach this Ed Center fo ed instructional focus and the um, Career Center instructional focus, and it will probably be more coming down the pike, instructional focuses at various institutions that we create, and I'm not gonna name them or anything, I just, I, I think they're gonna be coming, but it would be nice to have the same kind of deliberate process uh, that people take, in the same way they're accustomed to this rhythm, that they can become accustomed to that rhythm and know how to engage and how to be sure they understand mm -hmm. so that they can own and love the programs in the same way they have come to own and love the programs we currently have. But I think this is, uh, I think the last time we made a decision like this was with Arlington Tech and that was also unusual where we actually birthed the new program and that is also still in its infancy. So that took, I think, three years to get going, and we're doing this a whole lot faster. So I'm just advocating for being mindful of the process, sort of documenting it and trying to do it deliberate in that way every time. And it may require sort of a pip to the policy so that we, in the same way the BLPC has a rhythm, let's have the instructional focus have a rhythm. So just wanted to comment on that so we're deliberate about it. Okay, and um, let me try to wrap this one up too and, and make sure everyone knows what we're doing next. Um, as I think has already been mentioned, this, um, we have been working with the county board on this charge. We saw it at our joint work session. We've all been looking at the same version now. We will be taking action, charging the working group later this month. Um, the charge will probably be somewhat different, not substantively too different, but it will be a bit different from what's posted on board docs right now because we're still having that conversation with the county board. We've all kind of weighed in internally, they're working internally. We're gonna just sort of, um, you know, 
work out those details, but that's, that's going to happen. So when we do take action, what people will see on board docs will be a different version than what we just saw for information, but um, that conversation is going forward, and I, I think we're going to be able to do this. We will also at that point be appointing the working group, yeah. and we'll be doing that also jointly with, with the county board. would like to thank Ms. Talento for stepping up to be the liaison to the Career Center Working Group. Thank you. Woo! <laughs> and, uh, and Katie Crystal on the county board side is, is going to be the liaison. So um, with that, board colleagues, any new business? Happy birthday to Mr. Goldstein. Happy birthday to Mr. Goldstein. Should we sing? Okay, we'll, we'll do it after we, after we gavel out. All right. <laughs> We'll gavel it's out never first. too late to sing happy birthday. And it's within, it's within okay, seven to 72 hours. And they can cut the camera off. That's fine. But we all here can sing as everyone wraps all right. up. All right. We're doing it. We're doing it. Everyone ready? <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Reese. Happy birthday to you. Okay. All right, we are adjourned. It was Monday. <laughs>